Hey, Larry. Hey. Can you your name on. What's that? Can you change your name? Oh, yes, I probably should do that. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good Thank afternoon. Apologies about the technical difficulties. Uh, I got to find Tori. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Apologies about the technical difficulties and starting a little bit late, but we're gonna get started in just a moment here. While we're waiting, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share your pronouns and where you're tuning in from in the world. And uh, Tori should be here hopefully any minute, any second. Sure. And um, we want to start with uh, the the uh, Sam, right? Okay. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Sam y soy una de los intérpretes eh, que estábamos asignados para hacer una interpretación simultánea al español el día de hoy. Desafortunadamente, y lo sentimos, pero la función de interpretación de Zoom no funciona en este momento. Estamos teniendo algunas dificultades técnicas eh, con la aplicación de Zoom. Aunque esperábamos disponer de esta interpretación al español, hoy no podremos ofrecerla y lo sentimos. Esperamos que a la siguiente se pueda unir. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam and I am one of the uh, Spanish language interpreters assigned for today's meeting. We'd like to apologize today, but Zoom's interpretation function is not working at this moment. Although we hoped to have a Spanish interpretation available for today's town hall, we will not be able to provide it and we are terribly sorry. We hope that you are able to make the next one. Thank you. And thank you, Sam. And I want to echo the apology on the technical difficulty, but we're going to continue to uh, we're going to continue with the webinar. We're going to try to do the best we can with the interpretation and the communication. But we are so blessed and, and welcoming everyone here today. Um, I'm waiting kind of for my co-partner uh, moderator of today's events. Uh, but while I'm doing that, I am Larry Bryant. I am the senior. Oh, I am the senior program manager with the Reunion Project. I am also uh, a, a, someone living, surviving with HIV, going into my 38th year. Um, and Tori, as soon as she pops up, will also introduce herself. Um, but while she's doing that, we can move to the next slide. So we can thank our funders. Oh, well, there's Tori. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hello, hello, technology. <laughs> yes. Sometimes that's the best you can do. Uh, my name is Tori Cooper. It's a pleasure to meet you all, those who I don't know, and uh, be reacquainted with folks who I do know. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Human Rights Campaign and really excited to be here. Thank you, Larry, for uh, stepping in until our technology catches up. Well, I had to represent wearing the green and gold, so. Yes, so for folks who don't <laughs> know, Larry and I are alumnuses of the, alumni of uh, the Norfolk State University, not yeah. just the but the Norfolk State University. Uh, HBCU. One of the, uh, HBCU. Yes, I should have worn my t-shirt today. One of the oldest um, HBCUs in the state of Virginia, and uh, we are incredibly proud of that. And so if you see us going back and forth, the whole the green and gold, you'll understand what that means. So thank Absolutely. you so much, Larry. So please continue. 
Oh, yes. And of course, we would love to thank our funders. Thank you, Gilead. Thank you, Vive, uh, for supporting this kind of programming for people living and aging with HIV, both here virtually and in person. We are so thankful for your support. Um, and in our next slide, would be to introduce our host committee, our co host committee co-chairs. That's for you, Tori. You're on mute. So I'm gonna, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, Larry. No, I was gonna pass it to both Portia Dees and uh, Olga Irvin, uh, our two co-chairs for the National Host Committee. Uh, Portia is part of the first generation of children who were born positive. If it wasn't for her aunt and uncle, who she calls mom and dad, who took legal guardianship of her, she does not think she would be here today. Her doctor told her parents that he didn't think they uh, that she would live to see her fifth birthday. But God clearly had other plans. So she just celebrated another birthday. And maybe if you're nice and give her a great uh, greeting in the chat, she will tell you the birthday she just passed two days ago. <laughs> also, Olga Irwin has been involved in the HIV, uh, HIV community since 2001. She's an advocate and a speaker, a passionate advocate at that. Uh, Co-chair for the Positive Women's Network uh, in the USA in Ohio. Olga has put her body on the line in uh, in in for her advocacy work, protesting and being uh, arrested several times. She received the Trailblazer Award from Equitas Health at the Transforming Care Conference, and she is a community health care worker. Welcome, Portia and Olga. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, I think we're supposed to be introducing the... Um, host committee members. The host committee members now, so... Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to work with these this wonderful group of people on the on the planning committee or national host committee for two town halls now this this town hall and the last ten, town hall we had and um, I'm just um, I'm just super grateful to have been able to like um, share space with these individuals I should I, I don't know if I should go through and say all their names, um, but, you huh? You got it. We see them. Okay. <laughs> we um, see y'all. But yeah, like, like I said, I'm super grateful to have been able to share space with this passionate group of people and learn um, uh, from all of the unique experiences that they bring, um, have brought to the table in planning this event. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it to my wonderful uh, co-host uh, to talk about our theme. Hey, everybody. My name is Olga Irwin. Uh, and our theme today is remembering our resistance uh, and commit, uh, committing to joy. Um, this host committee has worked very, very good with each other. Um, one um, to bring our panelists to you. Um, we're hoping that um, you guys have fun all along with, you know, hearing, um, listening to our panelists, because that's what the part of committing to joy is that, you know, you hear our joy and you hear our resilience and how we talk and how we are committed to everything. And this was one of the best uh, groups I've ever worked with. We are all legends mm -hmm. in our own way. But also, too, we just like streamlined right through what, you know, the planning of this and making sure we got the right panelists and speakers. And I go, it's going to be moderator. Back to you. Thank you. That will be you, Tori. Awesome. So now let's do the national roll call. It's wonderful to hang on. It's wonderful to see so many folks already using the chat feature. So um, we're just going to continue to do that. We want each of you to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Are you a long-term survivor? This is a safe and affirming space in the chat. 
And also tell us where you're joining from. And if I can add to that, also share your pronouns as well. So my name is Tori Cooper. I am a long-term survivor. I'm entering in my into my 35th year um, and that I know of. And where am I joining from? I'm at the present moment in Washington, D.C. So let's keep it going in the chat. Uh, we will continue to do that. And from every once in a while, we're going to check in with you all. We're excited to have you all. And it's time to welcome Heather O'Connor O'Connor, for a nice grounding exercise as we get into further and deep into our session today. Welcome, Hi. Heather. Actually, real quick before Heather starts, I want to share just an acknowledgement to everyone. Um, we, as a group, as a staff, we want to acknowledge that, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now, and we want to encourage everyone to practice what they define as self-care. Take care, taking care of yourself uh, is very important, not just during the holidays or during this time of year, but all the time. Uh, so having said that, and, and with Tori's beautiful introduction, I will open the floor for Heather. Thank you, Larry and Tori. Uh, my name is Heather O'Connor, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the program coordinator for the Reunion Project. And I'm going to be very honest with you all. I come to this space right now feeling very stressed out because of the technical difficulties that we were having. And so I'm going to lead us through an exercise so we can sort of decompress and just allow our bodies and minds to prepare to take in the information that we're going to hear today. Um, and so I just want to start by closing our eyes and just taking a few breaths, just naturally noticing the flow of your breath. Noticing if you're holding your breath. And I want you to start scanning your body, starting from the very top of your skull. And as you move down to your eyes, your nose, your mouth, notice if you're holding any unnecessary tension in your body that doesn't need to be there. And go ahead and breathe into that. Take a deep breath together, inhale. Exhale, releasing that tension and moving further down to your neck, your chest, your sternum, relaxing your shoulders, taking a breath wherever you need to, to release that tension. Big inhale and exhale, release. And as we move our way down to our feet, giving extra breath to those areas where we're holding tension, I want you to take yourself to somewhere in your mind that's your happy place. Anywhere in the world, any state of being that makes you feel most like yourself, go ahead and take yourself there and imagine yourself there. What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What are you feeling? Take a big inhale together. And exhale. And wherever that special place is for you, I want you to carry that with you throughout this experience. And I want you to exist simultaneously with that experience and with that space that you put yourself in where you're feeling peace. And go ahead and open your eyes. Good, I want you to take your right arm up towards your ear and go ahead and lean up and over to the side, stretching your side body. This is creating space in between the rib cage. Mm -hmm. It's creating space for your lungs. Take a big breath in here. Exhale, releasing. Mm -hmm. Creating space in those intercostals. And go ahead and move to the other side, bringing that left arm up to your ear, stretching over. Good. And back to center. And I want you to go ahead and make a pillowcase with your hands by interlacing your fingertips as if you're holding your own hands. 
and go ahead and place your hands at the very base of your skull, where your skull connects to your neck, right? In that cervical spine. And I want you to bring your nose to your neck or your nose to your chest and gently press down with your hands as you lengthen the back of the neck and open up that cervical spine. Go ahead and take a deep breath in here. And exhale. Releasing any tension that isn't serving you a purpose. Big inhale here. And exhale. Allowing the head to return back to center. And go ahead and just move your head from side to side. Just seeing your range of motion there. Finding relaxation. Imagining that your head is floating up towards the sky while your tailbone is rooted into your chair like the roots of a tree growing upward. And go ahead and bring your head center. And one more deep breath together. And exhale. Beautiful job. Hopefully you're feeling a little lighter now. Thank you so Ooh. much. Thank you, Heather. Oof. Oh, I needed that. Mm -hmm. I think we all did, Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, glad you're smiling, Heather. Uh, so our first panel today, I'm so excited about our panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, first of two panels we're having today, uh, along with two uh, speakers. Um, so our first panel is the Lifetime Survivors Panel, Ready, Set, Live. Uh, our panelists today, uh, I'll start with Mars, uh, as I'm looking left to right on the screen. Mars, they, them, theirs, uh, identifies as non-binary, uh, was born in Puerto Rico, but raised in inner city Chicago. Uh, Mars moved to Albany, uh, New York in 2011, and adv advocacy work began for Mars at 15. And then born with HIV, uh, Mars spends time speaking, educating, and organizing with other community advocates and or, uh, activists and organizations. Mars considers themselves to be non-binary and now sits on many different committees uh, acting as a consumer voice for those uh, born with HIV or lifetime survivors. Survivors. Mars is a spokesmodel. Uh, if you've ever been to Mars's Facebook page, it's stunning. Uh, you can see more of, of, of Mars at the H, HIV stops with me.org. Uh, campaign and also is a board member with the Albany Damien Center. Uh, Mars is also the co-chair of National Advocacy AIDS HIV Network, a uh, special and part of a special interest group of perinatally diagnosed individuals or those born with HIV. Uh, Mars is also a Danny Lyons member and as a part of the national movement for those born with HIV or who were diagnosed in early childhood or under the age of five. Welcome Mars. Uh, and then next, so my screen is gone, is Portia Dees, a beautiful Black queen living with HIV. Portia was born positive in HIV, with HIV in 1986 and is from San Bernardino, uh, California. She has been blessed to see treatment and science for HIV come so far, but continues to work tirelessly to combat the stigma that hasn't really changed that much since the 80s. Welcome, Portia. And our third panelist is Richard Atkins. Richard is an accountant, an activist, and a lifetime survivor based in the Washington, D.C. area. Since he was a teen, Richard has served as, as a support group facilitator, camp counselor, and community advisory board member with a focus on empowering those um, living with HIV to not just survive, but to thrive. He has worked to educate the community through workshops, artworks, toolkits, and of course, panel discussions. In his free time, he enjoys cooking, reading, and working out. Welcome, Richard. And if you notice in the middle of that, I remember we have interpretation going on. So I slowed my speech down uh, and encouraged all of you to do the same as you're speaking. So welcome panelists. Um, my first question is a very simple question for all three of you. 
How do you define joy? What is joy for you? Go ahead, Portia. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I guess I would say like, um, uh, that, that question was kind of hard or in our theme, remembering I, our resilience and committing I, to joy, right? It was kind of hard for me to like, um, kind of resonate with the committing to joy piece just because, um, like, I feel like I, uh, I resonate so heavy with all like my trauma and sharing my story, um, speaking out, doing all the work that I do to like kind of help folks, um, you know, not have to go through the same things or experience the things that I've gone through and like, uh, you know, share my story and reliving all these experiences all the time. Like, I feel like I, I, um, am constantly, um, I guess like reliving my trauma all the time. And so like, um, when we, when I was talking about it with, um, another person, uh, the other day, I was like, try, like, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna just be honest and say, like, I think I'm still working through all of that. You know what I'm saying? Like to working through, um, um, all of the things that I experienced to get to that. Like, I feel like, um, I haven't, I know I tell this to people all the time, you know, like, um, you can still live a long and healthy life with HIV and you're, 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 uh, you are deserving and worthy of love. And I just, I feel like I haven't gotten there yet. Like I haven't reached my, had my fairy tale happy ending yet. But what I was told is, um, you know, you are enough, like right now, as right. you are, Absolutely. and to kind of um, live, let's see, um, it's not about the end destination, you know, because I keep trying to work to build myself up to like, right. <laughs> this person um, that, I don't know, that I'm trying to be like, and I feel like I'm not there yet, but it's all about the journey and the connections that I've made in working in the field and meeting and connecting with all you wonderful people on like even not just um, on the host committee and on this panel, but even the people in the audience like um, and just realizing that I'm enough um, right now by myself as I am and that um, how can I explain it that um, even though I feel like I haven't got there yet, like others may not look at me and, mm -hmm. and think that about me or like, you know, like, I feel like I'm my story. I'm, I'm sharing, I'm here for a reason. Right. And I'm sharing my story and inspiring others. And, um, like, you know, that's kind of what keeps me going, the work that I do and, yeah. <laughs> so oh, that's the joyful part of it. The connections I've been able to make, the opportunities that I've been able to um, have um, and the places I've been able to go, the things I've been able to do, like all of that is the joy. Right. Right. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I know I learned starting this work, you know, a couple of decades ago is you start to feel a little bit like a first responder. Like every time something's happened, you have to be there. You have to, you know, be the one to lead. You have to be in, you know, roll your sleeves up. We are the ones that do the work. You want to join those other people doing the work. And then we kind of lose ourselves in it. So finding yourself again, that process is like, that's that's finding joy. That's going to the sunlight, right? Right. Right. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Richard. Yeah, for me, um, joy comes from a place of gratitude, recognizing that with everything going wrong in the world, with everything going wrong in our personal lives, still being able to find something that brings you happiness, something that you choose, something that um, that whether it's for today or for an extended period of time that you're working towards um and joy just means that 
joy to me is a not a end destination but rather something you practice and work on every day mm -hmm. you said interesting word you said the the choose you choosing that path and a lot of times we we don't we don't realize we have that ability to choose yeah. we're uh, especially we're giving advice we're we're giving support to others we're giving guidance to others and we that seems to be like that's like autopilot for us in a lot of ways um we very seldom or at least we forget we need to be reminded to choose our our joy our path what what makes us feel good what what re you know re-energizes us um the work is is can be exhilarating but sometimes we need something that just fits us right mars absolutely absolutely um i have a little bit of both i can say um so for me joy is not only the work that i do mm -hmm. um 35 years strong here um but i have every i kind of wake up in the morning like okay what what do i need to do today and it usually starts with advocacy not my um not you know the other things that maybe are i'm responsible for on a daily basis but for me, joy looks like a few different things. It looks like me spending my free time volunteering and helping and, you know, being on the campaign representing us lifetime survivors. And then I'm a live in the moment type person. So for me, you know, joy is, um, you know, uh, an underlying tone, I think, just because I do feel like I'm living my purpose by continuing to do this work, um, pretty much no matter what, like it's in my soul. Um, but joy also for me looks like art. I'm an artist. And so mm -hmm. I tend to not use um, paint brushes if I don't have to. I do use like other tools like cups and things like that. But, um, you know, when I'm laying, laying my base coat, I actually like to kind of like finger paint it on, you know, um, I like to kind of dive into feelings that ground me because like you said like this this stuff can this work can be stressful it can be overwhelming sometimes because mm -hmm. it kind of requires a um you know a one of those it makes me think of one of those oil lamps you know where you've got the the constant bank of oil that keeps your your light yeah like yep. shining you know uh but sometimes you gotta you gotta turn it down a little bit so that you can rest and recharge and so between doing the work, the work allowing that those connections and things to really help refuel me and recharge me I also um am a solitude person and I spend a lot of time alone and doing art so yeah wow you just reminded me, Mars, I got to get back to it. <laughs> like, I, I got to get back to that self-care um, piece, because yes. I think that's what you're you're bringing up with your response. What does that look like? What does self-care look like? Self-care? Well, the, the grounding exercise that um, Heather just did at the beginning really, like, was like, um, like, um, like key, like, mm -hmm. For me, breathing, um, making sure to take time to pause because I got so much. I work, I go to school, I do advocacy work on the side. Like I'm always going, going, going. And so taking time to intentionally breathe and breathe through, like pause, not move so fast. And then, yeah, I, I'm taking time for self because I'm always giving myself away. Like, I don't ever, I give myself away all the time to so many different people and so many different things. And I never have time to like, you know, just sit, well, and when I do, I'm tired and I'm going to sleep, but like, you know, um, yeah, taking time for self to do some of the things that I love doing, like Mars, I like to do art. I like, I'm going to do it the... I Y kind of person like I like arts and crafts and stuff like that and you know yeah <laughs> taking time for self so one of the things I've noticed is very quickly I think anyone can notice from doing a little bit of research on all of you Mars and Portia I know y'all I've seen your work Richard I'm meeting you but I'm learning about you as, as well you make this look good you 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 you're energy your your kind of your engagement is natural that you know getting into advocacy for me it took a long time once I 
re regained my pulse thinking I was going to die. I didn't even know what advocacy was, so certainly not specific to HIV, but all of you have a have entered the space as an advocate. So I'll start with you, Richard. Like what what was your path? What did that path look like for you into transforming your energy, your words, and and certainly parts of your life into being an advocate? Sure. So I was determined from a young age that I didn't want anything to do with HIV. I was living it. That was enough. Um, right. It was through um, support groups and camps as not until later on in my life as a teen that I finally like got around to the point of being comfortable to be okay with myself, be okay with my status. Um, but still, I wanted nothing to do with the field of HIV. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I'm an accountant. That's what I went to school for. That was my focus. In 2014, I had the opportunity to attend the International AIDS Conference as a youth delegate. And I was there to learn. That was the Australia Conference. Ah, uh, OK. I was trying to yeah. Think. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I think so, the one right before um, that was in DC. Well, there I had the. Yeah, and I always went to the East one because I wanted nothing to do with that. But when I had the opportunity to go, I was like, okay, let me go here as an advocate, learn something that I could take back and use for my community, but behind the scenes, not in the public role. Right. Um, while there, I saw um, powerful women of color advocates. I saw um, the LGBT community out and strong but I did not see any lifetime survivors represented at all there. And I did not see any representation from cisgendered heterosexual men. Hmm. And I began to think like, are these populations important because they're not being talked about that? And then I remembered all the people who I um, mentored growing up through the camps or through the support groups who might never have an opportunity like this and they're not being mentioned here. So I begun to speak out and just say like, hey, I don't wanna leave nobody left behind, nobody falling through the cracks. And right now, like lifetime survivors and heterosexual men, like we're not being mentioned, but like those needs um, are there. And that began my advocacy journey. Thank you for sharing. That your, your introduction into this community sounds similar to mine. It was a lot of unfamiliar faces and voices uh, when I entered this space 38 years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's wanting to, to find that connection was very important. I did, uh, it just came from places I wasn't expecting. And, and now I'm surrounded by, by uh, I'm gonna say millions, but a bunch of beautiful people. Um, Mars, what about your path? Sorry, had to get myself off mute here. Um, so my path, so I would say my path kind of started when I was 15 and I was in high school. So kind of to Richard's point. So when I was in high school, I was 15 when I um, achieved my undetectable status. Hmm. So undetectable mean, you know, untransmittable. And so I was a part of a club called AIDS Action Club, and it was this four-year extracurricular activity type, you know, elective type class that you take in school. And um, I thought it was amazing that it was even being offered. I went to a nice little uh, charter school, so they had some very interesting classes. But this was when I wanted to see what it was that I could learn from them, having grown up, you know, being educated and knowing, learning all about HIV. I learned I learned that I had a germ in my body when I was four, and it wasn't very long after that that I put two and two together on what that germ was, and it was, um, at the time, AIDS, and then HIV came down the line, um, which was my actual diagnosis, but at 15, maintaining, getting that status, I, I asked my teacher if I could kind of tell my story. I spent the whole first year learning about HIV along with my peers, seeing different movies and things like that, and 
I just felt like there was this lack of human presence. Like no one had ever came and talked about their HIV experience, which I thought was odd. And so I offered and asked if I could. And the class was only about 10 people and pretty much all four years it stayed about the same 10 people and it kind of helped bond us and that was where I opened up the floor to be like okay so I've been with you for a year you've been with me for a year what questions do you have nothing's off the table and they were able to ask their you know real life questions that they had based on things that we had learned and it was there that my fire for advocacy kind of started um I, you know, focused on school and things like that for a while, but I moved to New York in 2011 from Chicago, and uh, as soon as I moved here, I kind of looked for that advocacy outlet, because I realized it was missing in my life, like, I had been focusing just on, you know, figuring out what the next year of life was going to look like going through school and things, and so when I moved, it was uh, a search for that. And it took me about five or six years to really find what is now, you know, kind of my home here in New York um, at the Albany Damien Center. And they are a very small, um, I won't say very small, but they're a small organization that caters to people living with HIV that are homeless. And, um, you know, they may have any, they may have other um, mental health issues and things like that but they're a center that kind of helps cater to all of those things for them. And I found home in them because when I went to go uh, see if I could, you know, volunteer for advocacy, they were like, oh, well, you qualify to be a member. And so they brought me in to be a member. And so it kind of created this interesting path and dialogue with our with our other members because I could speak to um, about as much experience as them but, uh, you know, I remember walking in that door. It was just another, I knew I was in the right place. I walked in the door, I signed up. And the woman that I signed up with, you know, they have the separate questions. How old are you? And then how many years have you been positive? And so I said the same year for both of them. And she stopped for a second, was like, wait, looked up at me. And she's like, so you're telling me you were born HIV positive? And I was like, yes. And this is about maybe 10 years ago or so, eight years ago or so. And, and so she was just so stunned that I was sitting in front of her and she was like almost like honored to meet me because we were diagnosed in the same year, hmm. but she had never met anyone that was positive. So that kind of started driving my force for me speaking on being specifically a lifetime survivor, not just, you know, a teenager per se or a young adult living with HIV speaking about my experience. So. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mars. And before you go, Portia, oh. I I love how uh, in entering the space, you entered at your own in your own way. Uh, you didn't wait for a predetermined path or or uh, kind of model to enter and to kind of join in. Although you learn from so many people and you connect with so many people, I love that your individuality, you as a human were, you wanted the space to help shape who you already were. You didn't become a new person because you were living with HIV. You became, you know, the fully your, your own, on your own terms, uh, even getting involved with advocacy, your messaging, your your presence, all of that is is all you, You're you're not, company people, so to speak, if you, I mean, I love, I love that you come with just pure, uh, genuine, uh, your pure, genuine selves. Uh, so in, in thinking about that transition through that question or the previous question, Portia, how do we continue to change that narrative around aging with HIV, living with HIV, that we become owners of that path, not just passengers along someone else's desire path, that makes sense. Um, so I mean, like, uh, well, changing the, so it, typically when you hear, um, folks talking about aging with HIV or, you know, they, you, you're hearing, um, them talking about the complications that come with aging as you get to 50s, 60s and beyond, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I feel like my population, our group, we are clear representation that like, um, you know, aging with HIV, it, it, you know, you can, it's, it's not about an age uh, range, but, you know, 
you can be aging with HIV since birth, you know, like, um, and a lot of us are experiencing the complications that come with aging with HIV that they say 50 plus 60 and beyond folks need to worry about. We're mm -hmm. experiencing them at younger ages um, in our twenties. Um, I know you said, uh, I, I, Hopefully, if they're nice to me in the comments, I'll share how old I just turned. You know, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm thir I just turned 37 years old two days ago, and so like I talk about that all the time. Um, that you know, I'm 32 years now, but beyond my life expectancy, they said I wasn't supposed to be five, and I know they told many of us that you know, and 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 I would be remiss if I. If I if I didn't sit up here and or mention that, you know, a lot of us didn't make it to mm -hmm. the 30s, you know, um, we're experiencing things like I experienced acute kidney failure. Um, my kidneys failed in 2011, um, you know, and that's kind of what going through that near death experience and coming out of it um, is what kind of and getting back into care after that is what kind of sparked my journey of like speaking out and, um, you know, taking my power back and, you know, telling my story, how I want to tell it and realizing that I was uh, struggling with my mental health because I didn't, wasn't able to um, articulate that at that time, you know, but, you know, we've, we've, um, we've grown up taking the medications before our bodies even had the chance to um, develop physically right. and cognitively. And so, you know, we we have weak bones, um, uh, uh, our, you know, cognitive issues, all those things that they say that you need to worry about when you get 50 and older, you know, we're experiencing right. much, much younger and, you know, um, so yeah, we, we definitely need to change the, the, the narrative around what aging with HIV means. Mm -hmm. um, and even younger than our twenties, you know, we need to do these screenings for different things like breast cancer and, and, um, and, and heart issues, kidney issues, liver issues, younger at younger ages, because, you know, I don't, you know, I, I didn't think I would make it to be this old and I don't, you know, hopefully I make it to be 50 and 60 and, you know, but so, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Richard Mars, did you want to add to that? Um, so <laughs> me and Richard are always fighting for the mic. Thank you, Richard. You're always such a gentleman. <laughs> Um, so, and Melanie, I love your energy. You happen to be one of the people that are on my screen. I just wanted to shout you out really quick. Um, just the support of this group has been awesome just as we're talking. Um, so to kind of add to what Portia was saying without necessarily repeating it, I'll take a different view um, and perspective. So last week I was just at like a World AIDS Day event and they were showing us a slide that um, showed that, you know, down our, you know, our statistics are, you know, specific to New York um, in this slide, but they were saying that, you know, we've gotten down to basically zero transmission between mother and child when, when an HIV positive person is having a baby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was kind of something that was like, yay, you know, and then I was on a, um, a panel the very next day and kind of was talking about the fact that while it's something to celebrate and it's a huge huge accomplishment it makes it easy to forget about what we already call the forgotten population we already feel like we've been kind of forgotten about when we're talking about the aging population because we do fall in that lower category of age and so I there's the reminder of the fact that okay we're still here those of you who are you know maybe at the USCHA conference you know that's what we are you know standing to say is that we're still here but it's it's a common theme that you keep hearing from us because we have to keep reminding you you right. know there's too many people in those conversations afterwards that are kind of thanking you for the reminder for it to not be something that needs to continue to be talked about so yes there may be 
less and less reported cases of people being born HIV positive, there's still a huge number, um, roughly 4,000 you know, of us were born just between the 80s and 90s that are still alive, uh, roughly 12,500 that are you know, from the 80s and 90s to today um, mm -hmm. that exist. And so when we talk about us, it's it's a smaller number when you talk about the big grand number of things, but it's it's a lot of people whose lives are at stake that aren't being advocated for. And I think that's part of what I stand for. And I know what the, the rest of the group that, you know, we're a part of stands for, so. Thank you, Mars. Hey, Richard. Um, yes, what Portia and Mars says, I agree 100%. The only thing that I would like to add um, when talking about forgotten populations is I don't want to forget those who acquired HIV through an early age through blood transfusions. Um, they're a part of our lifetime survivor groups, and they're a part of the forgotten population that because blood transfusion infections aren't happening anymore, that like um, mother-to-child transmission, people forget that there are people still here in their 20s, 30s, 40s who's been living with HIV the whole time. Um, Shout out to Ryan. The only thing that, yeah. The only other thing that I would like to add is that when it comes to aging with HIV, like we're kind of a statistic that I hear a lot is that if somebody is diagnosed at the age of 25, that they have the same life expectancy as somebody um, who doesn't have HIV, which is roughly 50 years. And so what I ask is, what does that mean for somebody who was born with HIV? Does that mean we'll live to see 75 or does that mean we'll have like the 50 years of living with HIV? And I've asked that question to multiple um, doctors and it's just like, we don't know. And it's, well, aren't we important enough for you to like do whatever research that you were able to determine that life expectancy and give us an answer? Yeah, I, I, I definitely, because I'm like, hopefully, I just put that in the chat, like, uh, hopefully the, the good Lord blesses me with 37 more, but I'm already 32 years past my life expectancy. So I don't know how much like right. you just, I'm, I'm nervous. The older I get, the more nervous I get. And you just, that was, that touched on that. <laughs> and that's where that self, self-care and those breathing techniques come in. Yeah. Um, I have so many more questions I wanted to ask. And I know we, we started late, so we're kind of short in our time, but I do have one question in chat I just want to get to. Um, this is from Robin Webb. Uh, I'm getting any one of you to to volunteer to answer this. Um, can someone talk about healing one's own internalized stigma as a way of drawing stigma-free people into your radar, as opposed to letting all the external negative forces affect you? In other words, can your positive energy bring uh, positive people to you and kind of shield you or protect you from all the negativity out there? That That question is deep. Um, <laughs> yeah, um <laughs> I think so like as I I feel like I um you know was vulnerable and ex expressing a little bit that like I still um struggle kind of with like I don't know what it looks like from the outside looking in but like you know that Oprah calls it post-traumatic growth right. um you know but so like I all of the things that I've been through have definitely affected me mm -hmm. and I still struggle with um, like that internalized stigma in a sense. Like I think like being a workaholic kind of distracts me. Not, I'm not just being a workaholic just because like I have the, you know, I live in California and it's expensive out here and I have to kind of do that to like make ends meet. But I also think part of that is like, because it distracts me mm -hmm. from like um like my my feelings or whatever my emotions and that uh those negative thoughts that like I still struggle with and battle with but right. um you know that's part of the reason why I started speaking out and sharing my story um and that is to uh kind of take control over my my narrative 
and tell my story in the way that I want to tell my story for it. Cause for a long time I was holding everything in right. and letting like fake friends and family mm -hmm. members and people talk about me and say whatever they wanted to say. And, you know, and acting like I didn't care when, you know, really it did affect me, affect me, uh, like uh, internally, you know, but so in speaking out and sharing my story and taking my power back and putting respect on our, my, my experience, our experience, yes. I've attracted all you wonderful people into my life, <laughs> you know, like, and I have attracted and, 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 and even some of those people that used to talk about me in high school and spread my business and stuff, like I've had people come back because they follow me still and they see mm -hmm. what I'm doing and apologize to me and right. say, you know, I'm sorry, we were young. We were, I wasn't, we were, you know, we're older now and yeah. they can't do nothing but respect it. You know, like I'm still mm -hmm. here, I'm alive, you know. Yes. Yes, you are. And according to the chat, all three of you are making it look fabulous. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mars. Thank you, Portia. Thank you, Richard, for sharing your experiences, just sharing with, with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank and you for having us. You're welcome. And I'll pass Thank it you. to Tori. Yes, again, I just want to echo. They're sending you wonderful love in the chat. I hope you all are checking it out, and we certainly are appreciative. Um, and, and I think just for context, I thought about something while you all were were speaking. Um, you, I, I wrote in the chat that you all are living history and you're proving science, and that's true. You know, there's never been a generation like you all where you're actually proving things to science in the way that you all now. So thank you for doing that. I also wrote down that a dandelion or or um, a, a lifetime survivor who's 30 years old, that's equivalent in many ways to a person who was diagnosed at 30 and is now 60. Yeah. And I think often we kind of miss that context. And, and you brought up some great, all of you brought up some great points, but I wrote down kidney failure. You know, I'm 53 years old. And so I'm a cougar, by the way. Um, but I'm 53 right. years old, and I thought about the fact of I can't imagine uh, dealing with kidney issues at my age after 35 years of a diagnosis, or nearly 35 years of a diagnosis, and someone who was born living with HIV and having to face that. And and we all know, and you you talked about bone density issues and and cognitive issues that happens, and these are things that certainly. Um, as you all are continuing to prove science, as all of us are continually trying to prove science just simply by living, because that's all we're doing. We're just living. We're proving science by living. Thank you all for putting that into some context that I think many of us can get a little bit more. So thank you all. We appreciate that. And with that, we're now going to actually move ahead to our next uh, presenter, Dr. Agu. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. So Dr. Agu is an associate professor of pediatric and adult infectious diseases at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her clinical interests include HIV and AIDS and infectious disease. Dr. Agu earned her medical degree from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, her clinical and research interests is in HIV AIDS and she has a special focus on adolescent and young adults living with HIV. She sees patients both in the pediatric and adult HIV clinics and as the founder and medical director of the, the Accessing Care Early or ACE clinic has been integral to the transition of pediatric patients to HIV with HIV into adult care. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It is my pleasure. <laughs> It's really, I'm glad I was able to get on early enough to hear um, Portia and all the fabulous Dan Lines talking. So I'm really looking forward to sharing and then hopefully having some dialogue. Am I able to share my screen? All right. Yes, I, I think they are. Me. You sh may have those privileges already. I think I do. I just want to make sure that I'm in the right mode. What do you see on your screen? <laughs> HIV and aging across the lifespan. Perfect. All right. Fantastic. 
All right, so thank you so much for, for having me here today. Um, these are my disclosures, got a lot to talk about. And here are the objectives. And I, I think hopefully uh, this is spot on with what I heard in the discussion before mine. So first really just to think about the current state of HIV and I, I think celebrate the many advances that we've had, uh, but also to describe the challenges, including the comorbidities that can happen over the life course among individuals with HIV. And then lastly, really highlighting opportunities to prevent and address comorbidities and optimize outcomes is really how I'm thinking about it. Love to hear your thoughts. I think, disclaimer, there's no way to cover everything. And um, I do want to say that as we talk about life expectancy and comorbidity and things like that, that some of it may be triggering. And I just want to, to, to own that and to, to hopefully disarm that and, and address that. Okay. So when I saw the, the flyer, I, I was really intrigued because I use the Sankofa bird all the time. And Sankofa is a word in the, in the Ghanaian language, which means go back and get it. And it simply means, I take it to mean that we always have to look back to know where we came from, to know where we're going. So I thought a good opportunity for us to look back. And I keep adding to this timeline, uh, which really talks about uh, the, 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 the story of HIV and from before we even knew it was HIV to, to now. And often we, we start in 1981 with the new cases, the first cases of HIV in New York and then San Francisco and like that kept uh, came coming out in the uh, MWR and beyond. The first women in H reporting with HIV was in 1981 after that. But then really marching through the timeline, including the first pediatric cases known to be perinatally acquired, in 1982, and I, you know, hearing Portia and Mars talk about it, those cases were chronicled in 1987, where they looked back from 1982 to 1985 and looked at all those those individuals who had at that point 300 of them, most about half of them had already passed away, saying just how virulent this was, and looked back and said, well, actually, the first child who was born with HIV actually was probably born in 1977. So even before we even knew, it was sort of already in our community and in there. And then highlighting first FDA test, just how remarkable it's been in the last 40 plus years where we've come with the epidemic to where we now have, of course, the 076, the trial which prevented or decreased the risk of transmission from um, parents to, to babies to antibiotic treatment, fully active or heart um, in 1996. Um, PEPFAR, decreased cases of, of HIV, and then we have the cures that we're seeing. And I, I'm going to spend some time at the end talking about cure, but highlighting where we are today, where we have over 35, 40 drugs and in combination of agents to treat HIV, really uh, a remarkable um, history. Um, I think it's important to talk about this slide uh, shows essentially the, the trends in, 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 in death, essentially, and showing we went from a time where it was almost cer certain death. And I think um, Portia said she'd lived 37 years too long because it was anticipated that many of the individuals who actually acquired HIV or those who were born with HIV were not going to survive. And now it's it's really more the exception than the rule that a baby will, will pass away from HIV, but our death rates have really plummeted. And that's across all age ranges. And that's due to many of the advances that have come together. And this just shows the contribution of the different age ranges to when we see that's related to individuals who are living with HIV. And so we know about 50% of people who are now the million or so people, million 72 to 67, that are living in the US um, with HIV, about 50% of them are over the age of 50, um, which means about 50% of them are younger than the age of 50 and with a smattering of, of ages um, along the way. And when we look at life, life expectancy, and I think it was Richard that was alluding to this, this slide that is, is from all the data, and I'll show some updated numbers that shows essentially normal life expectancy. I have that in air quotes, normal, because I don't think any of us are normal. It's about 79 years. And when you look at somebody who acquires HIV at age 20, it's anticipated that their life expectancy will be about 71 years, so a bit longer. And that's in the setting of taking current antiviral um, agents and, and, and remedies. And again, this is a little bit of older data, which has been updated. If someone has acquired HIV at age 20 and not taken their antiviral um, medications, it's anticipated that their life expectancy would be 32 years, about 12 years past that diagnosis. Now, I think this is really critical when you look at what you have is the years of comorbidity-free survival. So in someone who's uh, who's positive um, without HIV infection, you see 
there is there's survival to a certain age and the top line in blue with the circles, but then the, the lower than that, and so in the triangles below that is with HIV infection total years. So a bit lower, but again, approach, approaching that of uh, those without HIV. When you look at the comorbidity-free years, individuals who are living with HIV are less likely to have or comorbidity-free years. So they're living, but their comorbidities start to mount as they age. So more likely to have other things go on with them. We can talk about what those things are in a few slides. And then this is, I said, this is probably the most up-to-date data from Lancet HIV, looking at a big uh, cohort across um, multiple, uh, a big cohort of individuals at 40 plus. I don't know if you are seeing this bar at the top, so I hope you're, 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 what you're, you're able to see it, but it's an individual who's age 40 and looking at the general population about how ad many additional years they have, females versus males, and comparing looking at essentially um, life expectancy in the setting of being a female versus male, general population versus and in different categories. So just again, showing increased um, and then things that can impact that, including lower CD4 or um, being by you. I wanna go back to the age distribution of individuals who are perennially acquired or lifetime survivors. And again, showing, this is a data from 2017 and has not been updated, but showing, so we know this is now more of them that older age, but we see about half of the individuals who are born with HIV are really now over the age of 25, right? It's with shifting and some are in their forties. Important to talk about at the other age of the end of the spectrum, we still have a significant number of individuals who are older acquiring HIV. And I'll tell you why I'm focusing on these two populations, those who are acquiring it younger and those who are also acquiring it older. And that's because to speak to Richard's point, this graphic is really great for someone who's 20. And so we can say what our life expectancy is or would be in the setting of HIV with or without treatment. But as you rightly uh, mentioned, we don't know our lifetime survivors who are coming in the game um, at with 20 years prior to 20, and then we have seniors who are acquiring HIV older. What is their life expectancy and how do we counsel? How do we you know, predict what that could be? So I always start here because before we talk about all the things, I like to say many lifetime survivors are thriving. Um, many of them, some of them are in this room. Uh, many I've had the pleasure of encountering on different occasions are really amazing young people. And our long-term survivors are also thriving with all that's going on. Again, some of them on this call in this room, just really amazing individuals doing lots of things. So I wanted to start here. We oftentimes fixate here, which is at the continu continuum of care, where we constantly focus, particularly for young people, which is the population I tend to deal with, where we talk about in the continuum how they're least likely to be receiving care, re least likely to be diagnosed, least likely to retain in care, least likely to be virally suppressed. But we see that it's actually across all the age ranges, there are challenges with living with HIV um, for many reasons and multifactorial, many you can enlighten more than I can on this call. And I oftentimes say, what are we missing? I think we're missing the fact that life is dynamic. Adherence is hard. It's multifactorial. There are side effects. There's comorbidities. There's a life. Um, there's long-term toxicities. There's one size doesn't fit all on the same day or the next day or a given day. Um, forever is a long time. And we, we are, with, with in, in 20, 30 years, it is a long time and things change and impact how we engage. Fatigue disclosure, and particularly when um, we can talk about some of the younger ages where you you are taking medications way even before you've been even been disclosed to yourself and what does that mean and how disclosure changes over your lifetime. And stigma, while improved, is still there. Mental health, isolation, and just not wanting to be here, no matter how, how wonderful things are, not wanting to be here and dealing with this. I have spent a lot of time thinking about the life force perspective because I, I oftentimes are think, thinking about young people who have acquired HIV, but the life force perspective really applies to everybody, lifetime and long-term survivors, meaning how we interface with the virus, how we interface with our, with our environment, how we interface with things really changes over our life course. And we have to think about, and we were engaging our patients, our population individuals about where they are in their life course as that may impact everything for how, who is caring for them or, or how they're caring for themselves to disclosure, whether or not they've been disclosed to themselves or they have been disclosed to others and how often that happens. 
internalize and externalize stigma. Oftentimes in terms of disclosure, if you're not told till you're you know, 12 or 13 um, about your, your diagnosis, when you've had an opportunity to develop that stigma against HIV, and then you've told that you have HIV, how does that stigma then manifest in you? Um, there are the treatments and what's happened. And I, I look at the, the charts of many of my, my patients that I they take care of, and they tell the story of HIV, right? From our monotherapy to our dual therapies to our, you know, very atazanavir eye-turning therapies to where we are today. And many of their resistance and their patterns tell that story. And what is available to them now is also, again, over that life course, changes based on that story, um, much of it being adherent and how it's an impact of them. Adherence changes. Um, everything may be great when you have parental guidance and care, and then you may go to college and be hiding and be worried about disclosure, et cetera. And then comorbidities. I, I think we'll spend a few more slides talking about that. Um, you know, we do have, we've moved from where we had OIs in the setting of non-adherence with immune compromise and non-AIDS comorbidities, where we know that inflammation now is the, the rule and not the exception, even in the setting of, 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 of being aviremic. And we're seeing the evolution of com comorbidities across the life span. Um, care delivery changes and how you interface your environment changes. And then your risk factors changes from starting smoking or things that may be modifiable risk factors in early age to then how your body changes and how your, your, your lifetime changes just with, with the evolution of your cells, et cetera, changes and how that increases your risk in the setting of HIV and even without HIV. So in terms of all comers in the US, I, I always say to my, my, my patients that you're special, but you're not that special in the sense that all of Americans are having heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. And so how do we keep you healthy in the setting of that, right? So when your blood pressure is coming, we have to think about how to control that, et cetera. But everybody else is also having that 40%, 50% obesity. We have a lot of comorbidities. And this is the most common causes of death in all the age ranges. And as you see, if we look at everywhere from you know, the younger ages, it's unintentional injury. Um, and then as you get to older ages, you have neoplasms, then you have heart disease, um, and then you have you know, COVID and this is older and that's gonna change as, as, as things evolve. But this is the most recent data in terms of what are the top causes of death um, among all Americans, so all comers. When we look at HIV um, disease and, and the underlying cause of death, you see over the, the, the ensuing past 30 or so years, it has been unintentional injury. You, you see the cancers, you see unintentional overdoses, but you see that many of this is similar to what's happening in the regular population or the, the, the population who's, who's the general population. And this just breaks that down by by race um, and, and looking at the different populations where we know there are higher rates in some populations and how that also looks in individuals living in China. This is data from um, the JAMA a few years ago, looking at essentially um, at comparing uh, individuals who are living with HIV versus those who are not, and looking at risk of cardiovascular disease, kidney impairment, and several comorbidities, and essentially showing higher rates of heart disease, kidney impairment, and many conditions, fractures, you know, liver disease in individuals with HIV versus those who are not in, in a huge database. And this brings us to why, right? So uh, there is, there's background inflammation and inflammation that you see this, the pictures on the slide is inflammation is your body's way of trying to protect itself, right? To take away harmful stimuli, it developing a callus to protect yourself and then to allow you to heal. The issue is when you have chronic inflammation in the setting up of viremia, for example, where you have uncontrolled HIV, that prolonged inflammation leads to continuous active tissue injury, healing, injury, healing, and repeatedly, and that over time causes target organ damage, cardiovascular disease, malignancy, et cetera. So that heightened inflammation actually is being seen not just in HIV, but in a lot of disease, disease states. So we know chronic inflammation is associated with diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, cancer, musculoskeletal disorders. Everywhere you look, you're seeing inflammation associated in one way or the other. And in terms of HIV in specific, it is increasingly being recognized that HIV is a top inflammation and maybe cause it inflammation to be part of the pathway to then lead to premature aging, premature senescence or aging and increased risk of, of comorbidities. So when you put it all together, it's a combination 
HIV, maybe the medications, maybe the, the, the underlying conditions all together leading to heightened inflammation and increased risk of, of um, clinical disease. And these are just the pathways. I, I love figures to show how they all relate to each other. So in terms of the, the age-associated disease that you see, particularly as you're aging, HIV, inflammation, and again, the combination leading to the, 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 the chronic and clinical outcomes that we are seeing, particularly in cases where you have HIV plus other things, so HIV plus hepatitis C, HIV plus hypertension, HIV plus. So the, it's the added addition in the, the, the finger on the scale that may increase risk. So if we have to put it together one more time, HIV, our disease, kidney disease, we have higher rates of that. And then we have aging in general and the higher rates of heart disease, kidney disease as aging happens. And then you put the two together and perhaps the addition of HIV medication toxicity. And then you have the increased comorbidities and the probability of comorbidities. Now, often, this is always associated, when you think about the graying of HIV, you always think about people who are older. And there's nothing wrong with that. I told you 50% of the population is aging, but I also told you 50% are under 50 and wanted to make sure we think about that population, which has been my marching cry for many years to think about what's happening with our younger people as they age. So what do we know? HIV persists in early survivors of HIV. We know that from in utero, particularly if, you're, if you acquire um, HIV in utero or shortly after birth, you have HIV in place while all the development is happening. So there's factors that we know that it can influence with how HIV um, dynamics in pregnancy as well as what happens with the reservoir um, in, 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 in the, both the maternal and the infant environment. And then we know that there's persistence in, in long-term ERT suppressed individuals. And then we do a life, life, lifelong impact of HIV um, in the reservoir and beyond. So even in the setting of, of having viral suppression, we know that HIV still exists in, in the body in some way um, leading to inflammation. And so how will that um, affect our lifetime survivors? This is data from Debbie Persaud in the Pediatric HIV AIDS Court Study, where it is a large, probably the largest cohort of, of in the US of HIV exposed um, individuals, as well as those who are positive across many sites across the US. And what she did was look at young people who had um, started on antiretroviral treatment at a very young age, so less than one year, one to five years, et cetera, and then looked at those who were suppressed for long periods of time, significant periods of suppression and compared the rates of inflammation to those who were exposed but did not have HIV. And even in the setting of long-term viral suppression, they still had inflammation. They still had inflammation. So what does that mean? What are the outcomes, right? I, I, I heard in the panel discussion, what does that mean for us? And so in the past, we knew, or earlier in the epidemic, we knew it was AIDS-related opportunistic infections, um, AIDS of in individuals who are AIDS supply. And then as we got control or more control with antiretroviral therapy, et cetera, we started to see or starting to see cardiovascular disease, some malignancies, the medication side effects in the bone, and liver, and other metabolic abnormalities, central nervous system um, challenges, or whether it's cognitive limitations or actually strokes and 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 uh, cognitive dysfunction, and definitely long-standing inflammation. And I think we still don't know what the consequence of lifelong ERT or lifelong HIV will be. And I, I think there are people actively thinking about how to, to track that and not just track, but intervene. This is data for, from Ann Nealon, um, who's out in Boston, um, looking at essentially the, the mortality as well as incidence of um, first occurrence of, of uh, optimistic infection, um, not, uh, of mortality as well as um, uh, comorbidities among different populations in the setting of having high vir high, higher viral loads or non-suppressed um, viral, viral loads in the setting of having lower CD4 counts and the setting of having of age, showing that your lower your CD4 count was, the more viremic you were, as well as the older you were, and combining those two, the more likely there was to have higher rates of mortality or CDC class C, a WHO class C, or four events. So having events or comorbidities. And what were those comorbidities? STIs, fine. Um, hepatitis, mental health dysfunction, 
gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, bone abnormalities. And so seeing that again in a big cohort of patients um, in, the, in, in both fact as well as the impact. This is data from Jason Hall looking at the, the North American um, uh, NA Accord, which is a big a cohort of, of, uh, of sites in the US and, and uh, Canada, looking at rates of diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertrichosylidemia, or elevated cholesterol, hypertension, and chronic kidney disease in individuals who are appearing to be acquired or lifetime survivors under the age of 30 and showing the significantly higher levels than in the general population, looking back at this point. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention mental health because I think we're we're starting to understand more about mental health in the setting of HIV. So not only um, depression and 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 uh, anxiety and cognitive dysfunction that we have seen, but also neurodegeneration and earlier um, signs of neurodegeneration um, that may be related to long term effects of uncontrolled HIV infection, the CNS and and beyond. But as you age, then you add polypharmacy, you add antiviral treatment, you have HIV persistence, comorbidities. And then lifestyle things fold together that may, may, may impact mental health in, as people age. And that's for both those who are lifetime survivors as well as long-term survivors. So when we think about mental health, I would be remiss to just talk about as a biological level. I think we are increasingly seeing with, with and we saw with COVID for sure, aging can lead to isolation, uh, decreased social support and contact in a setting of declining health and fatigue, HIV, can do some of the same and you inter intersect that together and you may have increased rates of depression, suicidal ideation, suicides, which we are seeing. And so the combination being aware of what could happen. So how will we know? I think important is things like what we're having today is the voices of all those individuals who are uh, both lifetime survivors as well as long-term survivors, listening to everybody and having all of you tell us and, and sound the alarm of what's happening. I've spent a lot of time thinking about and writing case reports or case series. So see something, say something. This is the, the heart of a 23, actually it's a, the, um, the, the cath, the cath writes a cath lab, images of a 23 year old who was perinatally acquired, who had chest pain while he was in the hospital. And I was concerned he was having a heart attack and it took a, a, a bit of time before someone said, well, let's find, let's look at him. He actually was having a heart attack at 23. So case reports, case series, um, observational data. So we have to assemble and report no matter how many it is, um, looking at cohorts and forcing cohorts to look at their data. I showed you Jason Hawes data from the NA Accord. When we first went to NA Accord and said, hey, we wanna ask what's happening for younger people. They said, well, we don't have any young people with perinatal acquired you know, infection. We just don't, we, we, we don't have that many. And they have this big grab back category of other unknown. And we asked them to look and it turned out they actually had quite a few perinatal acquired. They just hadn't intentionally looked. And so now they're intentionally looking. And then it's modeling and, and trying to predict what we can, what we may be, be seeing. But to do that, we have to do that in order for us to figure out what can we do. And I, I, I start out by saying, you know, some of this may be triggering and some of it's be upsetting. And how do we think about it? I think we have to know what we're dealing with to then say, what can we do about it? So it's see something, say something, everybody's greater than their viral load. They're bigger than that. So in for prevention, we have to think about knowing our family history. Many of us don't talk about it, but what you come in and your underlying protoplasm relates to what you may be at risk for. And adding your HIV on top of that may increase your risk. So really asking those questions is prevention. Um, lifestyle modification. We are hookahing, we're smoking, we're doing lots of things that actually add additional risk. And so how do we intervene before those become an issue? Um, it's decreasing stress. It's decreasing isolation. It is sleep therapy, um, meditation, self-care. It is taking those vaccines to decrease additional risk of other things. Um, screenings, physical and mental health screenings. It is treatment. It is actually engaging in treatment as durably as we can um, for not just our HIV, but all the comorbidities that we may be seeing, monitoring, and then saying we see a signal and then addressing them. STI counseling, screen, screening, treatment, mental health counseling and treatment. Everybody needs that. Um, and then, you know, all of the screenings. And should we be thinking about screenings at an earlier age, particularly for those who have been living with HIV for a long time? And in preventive measures, this is the data from Reprieve, um, which was the, the large 6,000 person study, which initiated 
um, anti-cholesterol um, or lipid lowering agents in people who traditionally we wouldn't think would, would qualify for lipid lowering agents and showing in individuals 39 and older, if we started them on lipid lowering agents, so pibtabastatin, we had less risk of cardiovascular events. I made the point that it, people under the age of 39 were not included in that study. So how do we then factor in those who've been living for 39 years with HIV or 38 years? And do they should they also be on a lipid lowering agent and thinking about that? And then other things you can do, you're doing it here now, advocacy, decrease that stigma, research and, and, and joining research or pushing for research like you I heard you asking to find out, well, what, what's, what, what do we need to do and how? I think in terms of how do we improve outcomes, you know, I told you we have 30 plus agents. Um, we constantly need to be thinking about stronger, longer, safer, simpler. Um, thinking about drug resistance, since many individuals who are lifetime and long-term survivors have resistance. Um, thinking about different delivery modes and strategies for treatment and yes, cure. Um, addressing comorbidities, screening, prevention, and treatment, and prevention, beyond just writing a pill, we should be able to write for a prescription for the gym and be able to have our, our mental health, our health plans pay for the gym. Um, prescriptions for a hug, social isolation, hugging our patients, talking to our patients, engaging and seeing where they are. And then thinking about engagement strategies, behavioral and community interventions, particularly as people get older and maybe more isolated, how to reach them where they are, including different models of care and delivery of care, um, home community-based care models, using technology to bring um, them to us and us to them and thinking about how we personalize the medicine that we do. Um, and then research. This is the NIH sort of standard or, or, or paradigm for the research related to HIV, including reducing incidents, addressing comorbidities, developing next generation therapies, thinking about cure and cross cutting areas. And I think all very important to think about and include all long-term survivors in those different aspects and to also add the additional questions about, well, what will happen to me after cure, particularly if your whole life you've lived with HIV, what does that mean? What are you without HIV? And these are quotes um, by individuals who lifetime or long -time, lifetime survivors, what am I without HIV? And what about the things I already have? And how will they be the how, how will they evolve after my HIV is cured if they're cured? Is it like being a smoker and then stop smoking, does that go away? And how does that factor in my decision-making? And then advocating for funding. We're in a state where, in a general state where there's a thought about cutting resources for HIV care and HIV research. And we are not where we should be doing that. There's so much more to be done um, to make sure that people are optimized in their outcomes. So in conclusion, um, long-term and lifetime survivors of HIV are aging, that's a fact. And there are unique challenges and potential comorbidities that impact those outcomes across the lifespan. And being aware of those potential impacts is, is really key and important. And I think as it is critically important for us to think about um, and include the diverse aging groups when we're designing clinical care, research, and advocacy in order to optimize outcomes. We really need to be thinking about who are all the players at the table. And it is not lifetime survivors or long-term, it is all. But by the African program, pro, proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we need to be thinking about how collectively together we need to push for, for, for better outcomes for everybody. So with that, I'll, I'll stop um, acknowledging my, my patients, my you know funding, my team, and, and all of you for the time and attention. Really looking forward to some discussion. Wow because I can't think of any other words right now. I will simply say, wow, that was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much for that, doctor. And while we still have you on, there was actually a question that I think was really focused to you. Hopefully I can find it one. Um, uh, so I, this is going to be a question posed for you, but also for uh, some of the panelists, as, the other panelists as well. And one of the questions was from Jeff uh, one of the Jeffs, I think it was Jeff. <laughs> he wrote, chronic information started for me when I acquired HIV in my mid to late 20s. But for lifetime survivors, it starts from birth or early in life. Do we know the implications of lifetime chronic inflammation? I think that would be great for a medical provider to address. 
Yeah. So I, I hope I, I I showed the what we're seeing, right? So we know, like with Debbie Prasad's data and others have shown this, that even in the set of aviremia, so even when you are suppressed for long periods of time, there remains inflammation. And since we know those inflammatory pathways are linked to hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, then I think we are starting to see that accumulation. And I and I think even younger than we're realizing because we're we're not necessarily looking, right? We weren't looking. And so that is starting on. We are seeing it to hear Portia say, you know, at 32 or 34, she had kidney failure. We've seen kidney failures, we've seen liver cancer, we're seeing lots of things. And so I think our screening needs to think about these young people differently and think about them early on. Awesome. And what does inflammation do uh, to our bodies? but also uh, more specifically for people who are living with HIV. Yeah. So I think what, what it is, it essentially, so I'll, I'll pick the cardiovascular system, for example, right? So inflammation irritates your vessel, right? We know that the, the vessels are, are more likely to experience plaque development, clots, et cetera, right? Which would lead to heart disease, which would lead to strokes, kidney dysfunction, and the like. So it is irritating. It's, it's kind of like I showed the picture with the, with the, uh, the stub in the finger, and inflammation over time. And so then your body tries to address that, which causes more injury, which causes and healing and a cycle that's vicious that then leads to additional um, sequelae. Awesome. And how does someone uh, know when they're experiencing some type of inflammation? So that's a good question because we're not measuring it, right? So uh, I sometimes say to, um, to, to people, um, there is, even when you're, you're, um, not on treatment, people say, I feel fine, right? And then, and you can tell me if I'm way off on this, but oftentimes I, I talk to people, oh, I feel fine, I'm, I'm doing great. And like, oh, but yeah, I just had this, this little rash or this chronic this or that. And, and then they get on therapy and like three months later, like, wow, doctor, I didn't even realize that that may have been related to my HIV being out of control. I was five yards this. So I think it, it manifests in different ways from everything from things that we can see as well as things that we cannot see that are causing damage, right, in some way. Yes. And, and so thank you for sharing that. When I um, switched to an injectable now mm -hmm. almost two years ago, um, I remember saying to pr my provider when I went back after my first injections, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I feel different, but I couldn't quite explain it. And by my second infusion, I could explain, I still can tell the medicines in me, but something feels different. I feel less tired, though I still feel a little tired. And I was able to articulate some things and put some words together in the almost two years um, where I think certainly the medicine is working for me and it was working for me before, just like it's working for so many other people. But I think what happens is many of us have gotten used to feeling a certain way. Yes i.e. Infl inflammation, certain other things, um, feeling from the drugs that we don't know what it doesn't feel like anymore. Yeah, I, I think I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. But um, I, see a, I see a question I'd love to Please. address. One second. It's about the, should we be measuring inflammatory markers like CRPD dimer? So, you know, you're, you're <laughs> this has been one, I wish Peter Hunt or some of the people who study inflammation were on it, they can't agree on which factors they would study. So a lot of this is research settings, right? And the, they'll see, well, this four markers or these five markers, and it costs as much, and what does it mean? And so I think it'd be great. I think people would love to have a profile, right? So you'd be able to say, if you have, you know, D-dimer, CRP, um, SS, DCD-70, or what have you, your risk of this is that. People have tried to do some of those predictive modelings and it's been all over the place. So that's not ready for prime time yet. I think that would be ideal because then you could say you are higher risk because of this and your score is that, and therefore we should prioritize you for some prevention, et cetera. So great question, but it's there's there's nothing there right now that's ready for prime time. Hopefully um, that should be something that would, would be developed, but not existing at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Larry, would you join us? I am here. I never left. Uh, and we appreciate that. <laughs> well, thank you again, Dr. Agu. Uh, we are going to now, uh, Larry and I are going to now uh, do a little banter, and then we're going to take a short break, I believe, right? Yes, we are going to a little, not as short, well, a little shorter than originally planned, but yes, we're going to take a short break. 
Um, actually, we're going to end, we're going to stop and pause and do a little kind of check in with everyone that's that's on the call today. Uh, we have a Mentimeter poll. Any of you yeah. that have done a Mentimeter poll uh, in this new Zoom world? If you click a link, you enter a word, uh, and then we have this collective word cloud that appears. And our link is, uh, there it is. H Heather just put it in. Uh, and it links to the question of just how are you feeling right now? In a word or a phrase, whatever can fit in that space, how are you feeling right now? Uh, and as you're kind of clicking the link and entering your word, um, we're going to take uh, about a little more than five minutes. We're going to come back at 3.50. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Please stretch your legs, stretch your fingers, uh, refill your, your hydro. Oh, my ghost water here. Um, and uh, come back to us. And then we're going to share the word cloud that emerges from our Mentimeter um, hole there. So we're going to just log out, or not log out, just pause. <laughs> and we're going to restart at, what did I say? 3.50. 350. So six minutes from six. now, we'll restart. Yes. In case and everyone I'll... is not in the Eastern time zone, we don't want them to take 66 I'm minutes. sorry. Yes, six minutes. And we're going to come back with uh, the panel, Guys Like Us, Trans masculinity and aging that Tori is going to be leading. I'm really excited about that. Oh, look at the words. Uh, so contemplative, T tired is a big one. I can see that. You're welcome. Let's go to let's let folks go to lunch and uh, um, take their break, and then we'll talk about it when we come back. Yes. Yes. Great. Larry, I was filling in my uh, words, and then this popped up, and I can't hit enter. What do I do? Just go to the... Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. I was on mute. Once you put your... Yeah, once you click the link, you put the word in the space. Well, and... I was putting it in and getting ready to hit enter, and this, the what everybody else was putting in came in. And I don't see where I can hit enter. Try that since um I that think link again. Go through the link again. Yes. Okay. Go through the link again. You get to put in three words. And I think if you just hit enter, it'll it'll if you hit enter before you put all three words in, it'll it'll do that. So make sure you put your three words in first and then hit enter. Thank you, Wahida.
All right, folks, my phone and my computer both have 350 on them. So I think in the best interest of time that we're going to get moving, understanding that some folks may still be out taking care of themselves. Please continue to do that. But come on back. Um, we had 30, uh, 73 responses, Larry, to this Mentimeter. That's amazing. Um, and just briefly running through some of them, I see exhausted. I think that might have been one of mine, but apparently probably not the only person who put that. But then also enlightened, which is really good. Contemplative, thankful, tired, grateful, empowered, calm, misunderstood. What others do you see there? Bloated. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had the same uh, lunch I did, apparently. <laughs> yes. So all yeah. Yeah, all submissions are are appreciated equally, even the bloated submission. Bloated, the happy, bloated. grateful, blessed, excited, uh, validated. Uh, all of them. I, I love it. I love it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. Yes. All those wonderful yeah. things. So Brilliant. thank you all. We're going to do more of these and Heather's taking a screenshot of it. So this will be captured and it's going to be, it's part of history now. So thank yes. you all for, for taking part in that. Um, so as we move forward, we are now going to have one of my favorite uh, groups of guys that I know. Um, and this is uh, Guys Like Us, Trans Masculinity and Aging. And this is a really important conversation. Um, and it's actually for, for those uh, who follow some of us closely, this is really the second time this week we're having a similar conversation. Um, Pacha yesterday, there was a great panel of uh, uh, three trans men uh, who were speaking from their own experiences. And I thought that was really powerful because that's a group of folks who needed to hear that. And so we have a, yet another really esteemed group of advocates who are going to talk a bit about their experience um, and making sure most of us on this call aren't trans and very few of us on this call are trans, uh, very few of the folks on this call are trans men. So it's important um, when we talk about intersectionality that we hear from folks whose lives are much more similar than ours, even when we don't realize it. All right, um, that's all part of the blessed community and the blessed family that we are. And so first I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Atchum Jeremiah Howard. He's the founder of DC Trans Men Rising. He's an advocate, mentor, minister, humanitarian, father figure, and so much more. Atchum is still fighting erasure and HIV in the transgender community. He says, my life is so much bigger and greater than me. I'll continue to do what I'm called to until I don't have any breath and I will continue to fight for what is right. So thank you so much, Atchum, for being here today. Um, we also have Teo Drake, who is a community organizer, a teacher, and an artisan who works in wood and steel. He's a co-founder of the Transforming Hearts Collective, a collective dedicated to the spiritual care and liberation of queer and trans people. As a queer and trans long-term HIV AIDS survivor, his collaborative work to broaden access to resources for healing from trauma while working to end systems of violence that necessitate healing is deeply personal. He's a founding member of the National Advisory Board uh, of the Transgender Law Center's Project Positively Trans, yay, Positively Trans, and serves on the steering committee for the HIV Caucus. Teo's writing can be found in the anthology Yoga and Body Image and at the blog Roots Grow the Tree and his artists and crafts can be found at The Tinkering Gnome. I love that. And hopefully he'll uh, share that link for you all as well in the chat. You know, it's Christmas time, so you want to support. Uh, AJ Scruggs is a 35-year-old Black man of trans experience proud Black man of trans experience, living in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. AJ has been a trans tech member since 2021 and a champion for the program uh, that provides opportunities uh, that trans tech provides. Along with being an executive director of his own nonprofit, Visible Truth 365. AJ holds several positions and titles with and for some local and national organizations, 
such as his role at Take Resource Center, where he's the Civic Engagement Fellow working with the PA Coalition for Trans Youth, helping build a safer PA through legislation. In Mac, he is a third year trainer and certified coach for the Elevate program. Locally, he is a part of the Philadelphia Integral HIV Planning Council. AJ is also a loving chosen father, uncle, brother, and son. So welcome, gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having us. All right. Come off of our uh, mute uh, action because this is going to be a great conversation. All right. Um, Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. We couldn't have this conversation without you all. All right, so this is going to be really informal. We all know each other. Um, and so many of the folks who are on here, they also know you. But I think it's also important that they know about you as well. All right, these are not serious. These are, these are serious questions, but they're not um, questions that are, they're not going to be on an exam somewhere. So first of all, what I want each of you to do is tell, tell the folks, who are you? And I don't mean your bio. Just tell folks who you are. What you stand for. All right. As the baby of the bunch, I'm going to go ahead here. Um, I'm the mouth that had to be reeled in um, my more of a misguided missile. Um, when I came into advocacy work, I was literally like the guy on social media doing a lot of like talking but a lot of things that i was saying was making sense but it took somebody like atrum reeling me in like no nah, you you can do this a little bit differently so i tamed it down and became uh, a little bit better of a leader um which i've always kind of been um been doing like leadership and organizing since i was 15 years old became a peer leader in high school um so I've been doing this for a while. Um, and when I decided to really kind of focus in on us is when my status changed um, because I saw a gap. And I'm a problem solver. Natural Capricorns are problem solvers. So we, that's what I do. Um, also, speaking of being a Capricorn, my birthday's in two weeks and I do accept cash apps. Um, Love y'all down. <laughs> uh... Well, I'm a man of many hats. Um, I stepped into advocacy uh, when I became positive. Um, and really, I wasn't really, didn't think that I was stepping into advocacy. I was just advocating for myself. And from there, the, wind, the, the wheels start turning. Uh, Cecilia Chung. She saw something in me and she pulled me into Positively Trans, which I'm still a, a, a member of the a National um, Advisory Board still to this day. Um, I'm I just a man that like to fight for what is right. I like to stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves as well as speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Um, mainly that's what I'm all about um just just giving people the opportunity to understand that there are other people that need help that are not going to be out there um with a loud um voice or you know just standing out in the crowd but we do exist and um and I'm proud of my son who is really um changed the game and he's doing a lot of things aj i'm i'm just so proud of you i i say that on every platform that i'm on because he is reaching a, a lot of the youth um as well as knuckleheads that were like him you know and that is a bridge that needs to be you know crossed He's he's hitting avenues that um I can't, you know. So the difference is is that he's hitting a younger crowd and and he's doing things that I envisioned, 
and he's keeping my legacy alive and I'm seeing it why I am alive. So he's giving me my flowers while I'm here. So I'm very appreciative of that. And now in there. Hard to follow both of you. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm a quiet kind of very kind of, I'm probably one of the most reluctant public figures you'll find um, pretty introverted. Um, and I think mostly, I think for me, my work has been this kind of quiet, steady, presence. I think I love fiercely. I'm incredibly protective, um, particularly of folks, um, you know, that, that I that I love dearly. And um, and my preference is to be sort of behind the scenes. One of the one of the greatest things I think I can do in this world is to make other people believe that they can do anything. You know, that's the thing I care deeply about. I don't care that you've ever known my name or not, but I deeply care that the people that I love get to do what they love to do. Um, and you know, I'm half time kind of want to grow up to be a grumpy little old man driving around my neighborhood in a lawn tractor and the other <laughs> half of it is I'm a playful kind of a kid I, I and I teach kids martial arts and so there's a lot of me that is um both fiercely protective and playful and that's sort of kind of I think who I am most of the time well I appreciate that tale and since why well, I still have you on so what you you've already given us some examples that there's no one way to be trans all right you three are great examples of that. I'm also trans, so there's yet another way to be trans. Uh, what does it mean specifically to you to be a trans guy living with HIV? Because you are very, very open about your status. Personally, I've read about you before I ever met you. Yeah. Well, I think the thing to, to know is that I was diagnosed prior to transition, right? So, so at the time, I was presenting to the world as a as a butch dyke. And so I was not supposed to be even on anyone's radar with HIV. I had to beg to get tested, right? And so I think I've had this entire experience of, of HIV, HIV as being um, absolutely invisibilized. And so, um, and I chose the transition because I thought I was going to die and there was going to be no consequences. <laughs> so, but here I am. Um, you know, and I think for me, I don't know that I can separate out um, being a long term survivor, you know, and, and, being my authentic self, they just feel like woven together at this point in time, you know, and I don't know if I would have had the courage to transition if it hadn't, if my back hadn't been up against the wall and I was going to, I was going to die happy for fuck's sake, you know, and I think that that's um, a big part of it. I think, it, and I don't know that I can separate them out actually at this point in my lifetime, because um, both I think are about living, living with, with what's true and making the, the best of sort of, sort of the path in front of me. If that makes sense. It does. And what I heard you say was, I transitioned to die happy. I don't yep. think people are used to hearing it that way. Thank you for phrasing that. AJ, AJ, um, there's no one way to be trans. What does it mean to be a trans man in an HIV world? Ooh. So yesterday, I, the word responsible was like resonating over and over again. And then I now understand why um, the responsibility that I have as somebody that lives openly with my status, it gives me an opportunity to help uh, educate those that are um, within my community that the average agency would not be able to reach. Um, a lot of times we're not even thought about. So that, you know, for me, that means I have to carry that torch and be responsible for my community as a whole, not just my personal. Um, but it also means that I'm a brother, uh, a big brother, a loving big brother who um, is super protective. Um, and I'm an uncle um, to three very hyperactive uh, individuals. Oh, um, love my sister's kids. Ooh, they gonna give me give their uncle a heart attack over Christmas. Um, but I'm I get to be that person that I wanted to be in the world. I get to be respectful, responsible, but also have a family and uh you know, bring something else into this world and leave it better than what I found it. Hmm. So to me, it's just being a regular person wanting to be a decent human being. Being a regular person because there are folks who think that you know that we want to be these unicorns they those are labels that are, uh, are described to us but i think most of us just want to be regular people so thank you for sharing it 
um, action. We're hearing all these attacks by the opposition about gender affirming care. All right. We had a doctor on there. There are folks who are on this call right now who have no idea. The only thing that they know about gender affirming care is what Fox News says. All right. What does that have to do with HIV, you might be asking? Me. Well, you tell folks, what does gender affirming care have? To, what does it mean to you and for people like us? But then also, where does gender affirming care fall for people who are living with HIV? Okay, when I was diagnosed, I was transitioning. Um, I had I would have been in my transition for uh, a couple of years. Um, so to me, me not understanding the word, I knew. HIV existed. I've been around people who were diagnosed with HIV, living with HIV. They were living happily with HIV. But for me, I th me, I thought I was going to die. But my doctors and uh, my provider, well, I'm going to say my providers, they gave me the hope and the strength to uh, end it the encouraged to it, you're going to be okay even though you have the diagnosis you still going to be who you are as an individual i knew who i i know who i am and i knew who i was and i was becoming the man that i wanted to be but that bridge right there was one of the things that was very difficult for me with education which a lot of people don't understand that that educational piece is not just for um, trans individuals. It's also um, important for for others. And just like you can live happy with HIV, so can I. And gender um, affirming care is basically on the same on the same route because brothers are dying from suicide because they can't be who they are or uh, they're not uh, afforded the opportunity to be who they are as an individual. So for me, it's very important on both sides that we not only just allow people to be who they are, but allow them to have the health care that they need so they can be who they are. Because that's the most important thing. Because both of them go hand in hand. Because I know with me, I contemplated suicide because at an early age, I couldn't be who I was. So I feel for the, the youth that's coming up and the laws that they're trying to take away, that or that they have taken away, um, because now you're not going to hear about the trans guy who killed himself because now they're going to say a girl killed himself or, or a woman killed themselves. They're not going to, unless we know that they're trans, we're not going to actually know that they are. And there needs to be, I feel as though there need to be more sur um, surveys and and more um, proactiveness within our community as well as people living with HIV to stand up with the trans men because we have been invisible for so long and now that we're having our voices people need to stand up and I I for one am um, putting out a plea to all of the trans men that we need to stand up we need to have our own voices and our own stories because that's what's important. I love that. And thank you, uh, Larry, for, yeah, one of, if anybody who follows Atchum, and I hope you all follow all three of these guys, uh, Atchum says to wake up is to be woke. Lord knows that's true. And I think it's also important. What I heard you say was 
gender affirming care, nobody said anything about surgeries. Did y'all notice that, folks who were listening? Sometimes gender affirming care is simply calling by the name that I told you is my name. That's for adults, because I purposely didn't ask the question about kids, but kids came into the conversation. I asked the question, what's gender affirming care? And for people who, uh, women who are cisgender, that means a woman who was assigned female at birth, who still identifies as a woman, gender affirming care, you get as well when you go to an HIV provider and they give you a referral to uh, a breast specialist or to uh, a gynecologist. Colleges. That's gender affirming care. And so what has happened is the opposition has made you three into the devil because you need to take care of your mental health as well as your physical health and your HIV. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you're, Tori, you're making the, the, like the big point, right, is that um, we know that treatment is prevention. Mm -hmm. And so, but people, you know, it's a, it's a long haul, right? Living with HIV isn't, particularly for those of us who've been, who've been doing this for a very long time, it's not easy, right? And you have to be able to see yourself in the future if you're going to fight for that. And, and most of us can't see ourselves in the future if that future is inauthentic, right? And so to get people to stay in care and to get folks undetectable, they have to have something to fight for. And that's what gender affirming care does in all of its spectrum. And at the same time, for folks who, who have not acquired HIV, to be able to actually say no, to be able to actually ask for their body to be respected, to be able to set limits and pressure requires you to care about, about your life and, and your life expectancy. And it's so hard to do that if you can't see yourself in the future. And so I think gender affirming care is simply a way of actually helping us be able to locate ourselves in the future authentically. And it gives us something to fight for, whether regardless of whether we're HIV positive or negative, regardless of where we come from, if you can't see yourself in the future in a way that feels authentic, none of us are going to deal with aging well. It's just not going to happen. You have to be able to do that. AJ? Um, gender affirming care can be as simple as not, not sending your trans masculine clients to the woman's center to the OBGYN. Um, you don't know how traumatic it is walking through the door as a man, having to sit in that lobby, being presented as a man with stares like, well, what are you doing here? Where's your wife? Where's your other, you know what I mean? Where's your partner that's actually supposed to be receiving services and why are you here? Um, so now you have this man in a woman's space, which dysphoria for you, uncomfortability for the other patients, and then heaven forbid they mishandle your information. And what if your name is not changed? They call you by your first name um, or your non-chosen name, because I'm going to call it that, the non-chosen name. Um, if they're not aware that, you know, you would rather be called your chosen name or your name that you have solidified for yourself, that's instant dysphoria. That's instant anxiety that puts you in, puts you as a person in a horrible state of anxiety and a likelihood to walk out the door and not receive services. Say that again. We'll hit it in short. <laughs> yes. And so what happens is the system that was there to provide you service has all of a sudden treated you in a way that makes you not even want to want the service. And as a as a requirement, like we're supposed to go yearly to get pap smears um, just to make sure that if you are if you still if you have not had a hysterectomy, this, this is the caveat. If you have not his, had a hysterectomy in a lot of places, well, at my provider, one of the things is that yearly you're supposed to get a pap smear um, just so they can kind of like gauge where you are. Any changes that may have happened over the years with side effect medic from their medications. Um, and also the side effects of testosterone, because like I'm pushing that at my at my provider. I want to know what's happening over the next two years. Why did I go dark? I don't know. We can still see you. It's still beautiful. But I think that was really important what you just said, because folks, women, people who have uteruses who aren't trans can relate to what you just said. If you're over 35, you still need to get a pap smear every year. So suddenly. You're not just a unicorn that lives off in trans land. There's something that we have in common that I never thought about. And I think one of the things that the opposition has done successfully is they have attempted 
they have created this chasm, this divide, this otherness of trans people, um, of who we are, and most importantly, who we're not. And what it has done is it has worked in a lot of different places. There are people in the HIV movement who still think that we all are so different when the truth is we're encountering many of the same things. All right. So um, here's a good question. Asham, I want you to address this first and then I'd like some of the guys to, other guys to jump in as well. Notice I don't keep saying trans because you're just guys. You just happen to be trans. All right. And it was some white people in lab coats that created the terms trans and cis anyway. That wasn't us. All right, so how are men and folks, uh, trans men and folks who are masculine of center missed in diagnosis, treatment, and research for HIV? Uh, we are misdiagnosed and treated for HIV. Mm -hmm. Being put in different categories that we're not supposed to be in. Such we're not being, we're, we're, the data is not being collected for trans men, so therefore, they don't think that we exist. Is that the is that the answer? I mean, that's uh, that that's that's <laughs> basically that's it. what it is. Yeah, that's that's basically. No, basically, that's what it is. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. If somebody tells you they're trans, get your head out of their genitals unless they invite you there. Because that's what happens when well, the people admit that somebody identifies themselves as trans, and what happens is you start immediately thinking about that area in their, their private area, and you treat mm -hmm. them based on that rather than the name they gave you, rather than the mm -hmm. pronouns they gave you, rather than the experience that you got from them when you saw them walking in that room. We have to stop doing it because we do it in HIV as well. I can't believe we only have four minutes left, but we're going to make the most out of this four minutes. All right. So, um, okay, here's a question for each of the three of you very, very quickly. So what is the end? So the end in the HIV epidemic, there was a, and a really, um, there's a goal to end the HIV epidemic uh, by 2030. So what does uh, the end of HIV look like for each of you? Very quickly, and then we have one more question. The end of HIV for me would be. You put yourself on mute action. Diagnosed with HIV um, people understanding that those who are living with HIV um, can live productively and healthy um, just elevate Atchim you put yourself on mute again just elevating the whole entire um, thought process mm -hmm. of knowing what to do and to protect yourself to do what you need to do in order to be healthy or not to be diagnosed. And that's that's the that's just the thing that you have to have that educational piece. We have to have the data. We have to have the um the knowledge within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Surround yourself and people, and the, keep government out of our bodies. How about that? How about that? Because I don't want Ron to Satan to have any part of this. All right, so AJ and then Teo, tell us very quickly, what does the end of the HIV epidemic look like for you? Um, it looks like funding for data and research. It looks like intentional data and research on all AFAB bodies, including um, cisgender women, because they don't, have, they, they too are still often forgotten. Um, anybody that was assigned female at birth for the folks that aren't familiar with the, the acronym AFAB, I just wanted to put that out there, it's a sign female at birth. Um, AFAB bodies, data research, it, it, it's unprioritized and it should be um, for multiple reasons, but we can get into that in part two for 2024. Awesome. Very quickly, Teo, what does the end yep. of the HIV epidemic look like for you? 
It's certainly having a vaccine, but not just a vaccine. Like people still have to give a fuck that those of us who are living with HIV are living with HIV after that happens. Um, having a cure, but also not simply those two, two things. It's making sure that those two things are available for free to every single person, particularly people who are impacted by health inequities. So making sure that it's not enough to have them. It's enough. It, they have to be rolled out in a way that everyone has access to them. And I think that's at the point where I'll be able to say, okay. HIV has come to an end, but until it's in the hands of everyone, it doesn't matter that we actually have those things available. Thank you. Because the same opposition who is saying that trans kids have no rights and their parents don't have any rights are the same people who are saying that um, you can't be who you are, are the same people who are saying vaccines don't work and people shouldn't take them, are the same people who are saying PEPFAR should not exist because somebody's getting an abortion in some country they've never visited are the same people who are saying the Ryan White program. I could go on and on. You get what I'm saying? It's the same mm -hmm. people that are coming up with this crazy BS. Um, so since we got to go, we want to end. I love doing I, we, you. All right. You're going to get very quickly. You all have one minute each. I, we, you. And I statements, you as an individual, we, whoever your community is, and then you is something that people who are listening need to do or be, okay? Um, Atchum, AJ, and then Teo in that order. And you got to come off of mute again, uh, Atchum. I said, you, the dogs are barking back here. That's why I, turned, I was on mute. Um, they was quiet all day, but when I start talking, they want to start barking. They love you. Um, <laughs> you say, I, we, and you. I, we, you. I am a legacy. We all need to come together and work together to end the epidemic of HIV. And then the you, to wake up is to be woke, knowing that there's more work to be done. Thank you. All right. I do this for all of us. And we will continue to fight. You should be a part of that. Ooh. Thank you. I think for me, um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the people who love me when I can't do that for myself. Um, and then the we is that um, the, we, won't, we won't be here if all of us aren't together. None of us are going to survive. Um, and the you is um, in part that there's not a division between we and you. And so if we're not at the table, and we can't always, but we should be, we can't always, then you need to make sure that our voices are there, even if our bodies are not there. And that's the thing I ask for. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what we forgot to mention in their bios is that all of these three gents are consultants as well. So please make sure that you put your contact information in the chat as well so folks can get in touch with you. Uh, Larry, welcome back. Thank you all. Let's give them a virtual hand clap and, and you know. Thanks and, for making this easy, Larry. That's what we do for each other. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's the other idiots that try and make it hard. <laughs> all right. Larry, how was that? That was amazing. I, I'm just, I was sitting here taking notes. I'm already thinking about 2024, but yes, this is a conversation that needs to continue. And I'm so happy that Achim, that uh, uh, Teo and AJ were, were here to, to kind of share themselves as well. So thank you, Tori, for that conversation. Uh, one thing I love about reunion project events, either virtual or in person, is that we blend the connection with the information uh, while we're sharing our humanity, we're also sharing stats and and is, uh, policy issues and everything uh, that comes with with ending this epidemic. And our next speaker is in line to do that as well. Terry Wilder, uh, and there she is, uh, is the HIV and aging policy advocate at Sage. She has worked in HIV and the LGBT plus health since 1989, providing social services coordinating education programs for clients, medical providers, and advocating for policy change. She has presented at local, national, and international conferences on a variety of HIV topics. Many of her articles on HIV can be found on the body 
the body's website, thebody.com. Go there and check it out. Uh, Terry has served on uh, the New York Governor's Task Force to End AIDS and the New York uh, Governor's Hepatitis C Elimination Task Force. Uh, Terry is currently a member of the New York State Department of Health AIDS Adv Advisory Council uh, e or the ETE subcommittee as well as the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention or the MCH ACP. Uh, Terry has been recognized for her work via the Paz 100, cele celebrating women edition of Paz magazine back in 2017. And she continues to do uh, the work that you're going to hear about just in just a second. Uh, and as well as awards from the New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute, AIDS Survival Project, and Bridging Access to Care, Inc. Terry, welcome. Hi, Larry. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> So I'll yeah. just get out the way and let you get started. Awesome. So I'm going to pull up my slides and I just need to ask for this beautiful community, no judgment on my desktop. Because <laughs> it is messy. Uh-oh, better close those tabs. <laughs> I know it. All right. <laughs> so um, I am going to share my screen. And while you're doing that, Terry, I'm going to remind all of our, our viewers and listeners out there, I just put the evaluation chat uh, in the link again, in the chat again, or evaluation link in the chat, please feel free uh, to fill that out as soon as you can. Your voice matters, uh, moving, uh, helping us develop these programs. Um, so thank you. And Terry, you're up. Great. And Larry, you can see this? Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so as Larry said, I'm here to give an HIV aging policy update. I, you know, had to pick you know, like four areas. Of course, this could be like a whole day conversation. Um, so tried to pick things that um, I think would be important for folks in the community to hear about. Um, so before I get started, uh, just want to share a little bit about SAGE if you're not familiar with us. Um, so we are the country's largest and oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus older people, as well as older people living with HIV. Um, I am coming to you today from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, but just to mention that we were founded in 1978 and our headquarters are in New York City, which is where we provide the majority of our direct services. So we have housing. We have a program called Sage Positive for older folks living with HIV. Um, we have kind of what you would think of as a traditional senior um, center. We have a couple of those in the city, um, but we are a national organization and we offer supportive services and consumer resources to LGBTQ plus older people, older people living with HIV, their caregivers, providers, healthcare providers. Um, so just to set the stage of where I work. Um, so the first policy issue I wanna talk about is that uh, we need to tell Congress to save HIV funding. Um, so I am hoping that folks have heard over the last couple of weeks, uh, leaders in Congress have been calling for millions of dollars in cuts to HIV funding in the United States. Um, we, I had a lot of campaigns around calling um, congressional members um, and that kind of call to say the HIV funding uh, was reinitiated this past Friday on December 1st. Um, and uh, like I said, there was a big call about a couple of weeks ago, but this campaign actually launched in September due to these proposed cuts. And like I said, it was revamped in World AIDS Day. Um, with support from over 100 different organizations. Um, the key purpose in this campaign is to get the community to send pre-written letters to the representatives in the House and in the Senate. It only takes a few minutes, um, so you can use this um, code um, here if you want to just pull up your camera and um, uh, get that moving. You could actually do it right now as I'm speaking. It just asks you to put your name, your zip code, and contact information, um, and it will populate that for you to send out those letters. Um, some legislators may even write you back. 
um, to get more information. Um, so here is a great way to take action right now um, to let people know that we need this money. They cannot cut this funding over politics. Um, so as has been mentioned several times um, over this program, the number of older people with HIV is increasing um, and older people are folks that were born with HIV, folks who were diagnosed in their later ages. Um, thinking about my friends who were diagnosed in the 80s and 90s, we have these like whole cohorts of people who are kind of aging um, together. So we really have to think about right now and the future. It was mentioned earlier that, you know, a little over 50% of all people living with HIV are 50 and older. And by 2030, that's going to be 70%. I mean, that's less than seven years away. Um, so we are really thinking about you know, how can we have protections and services for people as they age? So let me share a couple of things that will be important to think about. So this is President Lyndon B. Johnson, and um, it was under his administration that the Older Americans Act was introduced. Um, and it was really the intent to... Um, you know, make sure that older citizens in the United States were available to get services, to meet their needs, and to really protect their ability to age in place. Um, so just to give you some ideas here about what the Older Americans Act provides, if you're not familiar, it funds some real critical services for older people to keep them healthy and independent. So if you live in an area where there's a senior center, it's more likely that they get some Older Americans Act funding. Um, Meals on Wheels is another service that's funded by Older Americans Act. There's also job training, health promotion, transportation, caregiver support. And this money comes from the federal government. It goes through the states and then to these uh, what's called area agencies on aging. And so that, that's how it really gets to local folks. Um, and these services are directly provided to people in towns and cities across the country. Um, it is um, managed by the Administration for Community Living in our federal government. And so, you know, one of the things that is going to happen in 2024 is the Older Americans Act is going to be reauthorized. And so, you know, one of the things that I would love for folks to think about and reach out to me about is thinking about as a person aging with HIV, what do you think you need to age in place? We would really love to hear your thoughts and I would love for people to contact me if they'd like to get together and have a call um, so that we could really hear from folks and document that and then take it to the elected officials that are really behind um, pushing through this reauthorization. So we really have this opportunity right now um, to give very specific information um, to folks in DC about what should happen in this reauthorization. And I do want to say that this is a program that has historically been for people 60 and older. Um, but the other night, uh, myself and my colleague at SAGE, Emma Basser, um, had a had the opportunity to meet with a group of lifetime survivors and talk about, you know, what would it look like if we, you know, put forth a recommendation about the Older Americans Act to let people who were younger than um, 60 receive some of these services? Because when we think about how HIV uh, impacts the body and accelerates or accentuates aging, you know, I think there could be room for an opportunity to advocate for maybe changing these kind of age limitations um, within the Older Americans Act to be more inclusive of the experiences of people living with HIV. So I also want to talk about 
you know, not only this kind of reauthorization that's happening at the federal level, but that there's these opportunities to advocate at your state level. Uh, so each state in the country is required to have a state plan on aging, and it's really a blueprint for the Older Americans Act services. And it, you know, requires states to come up with goals and objectives and strategies and outcomes and performance measures. It needs to be grounded in um, data, and it's developed by the state unit of aging with stakeholders, advisory councils, et cetera. And, you know, there was a new, a new state plan guidance that was issued in 2021, and it requires states to include in their future state plans how they're going to serve older adults living with HIV. So there's this real opportunity for people to get involved. Every state is different. A lot of states will hold webinars and town halls um, before their state plans are due. There's this opportunity to get involved with your local area agency on aging to give them feedback and input on you know, what their services should look like for people living with HIV. You know, many of these states have advisory councils and they hold hearings. Um, there's regional administrators that can be a point of contact to give feedback on. And if you're wondering like, well, how would I even get in touch with someone? Well, here's a way to find your regional office or your administrator. There's a website you can go to to look up for your state, um, who is your contact there. And if you wanna look at kind of where is your state plan in this process, you can also go to this link, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sneak peek on some of the state plans that are coming up. So I encourage you to pay particular attention to these next states and see if your state is on there, because this is really an opportunity for advocacy here. So the state plans that are due July 1st, 2024 are Alabama, Delaware, Idaho, Illinois, Maine, Nevada, Pennsylvania. Some of these folks have already started gathering to get stakeholder um, feedback but there's still a chance for you to reach out to your folks that are in charge of these state plans on aging. So these are the plans that are due in 2024. So that's coming up, you know, before you know it. So for folks who have plans that are due in 2025, take a look at this list. So it's everywhere from California to Florida to Tennessee, New Mexico, New Jersey, Massachusetts. So this is an even earlier opportunity to get involved and give feedback on the needs of people with HIV. So I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about another policy opportunity, um, which is looking at having LGBTQ plus and HIV long-term care bill of rights in your state. Um, there's a couple of states that have already done this and I'll share who those are. Um, but these Bill of Rights are updates to state or local law that already exist, and their intent is to protect people from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and HIV status in long-term care settings. And it mandates LGBTQ plus and HIV cultural competency training for staff. Now, we tend to think of long-term care for people who are quote-unquote older, but this is for anyone who has HIV and anyone who is L who identifies as LGBTQ+. So while maybe a uh, you know, larger percentage of people may be older, this really is bills of rights that'll protect anyone that has to go into long-term care. And I should note that long-term care doesn't just mean nursing home. It could be a rehab facility, like, you know, you broke your hip and you, you know, have to go to physical rehab in a facility. It would also apply to that. So some of the examples of we've, w that we wanna raise up is that, for example, it would make it illegal for a long-term care facility to deny admission based on a person's sexual orientation, gender identity, or living with HIV. I wanna give you uh, an example of uh, where this has happened and continues to happen. So this is um, the headline from an article from Paws Magazine um, from a couple of years ago. There was a story in Paws that talked about six nursing homes um, 
are accused of HIV discrimination. Um, and this is the picture of um, Courtney Scheller and her father, John. Um, so when Courtney was looking for a nursing home in Nebraska to care for her father, who's living with HIV, she had been his main caregiver, but his needs became um, more complex and um, she really needed that extra 24 seven care. Um, she was pretty shocked um, that when she reached out to facilities that they refused to accept him. And so um, sh the ACLU got involved and sent letters to the nursing homes warning them about the potential consequences of their actions and offering solutions. Um, if you go on to read the story, it actually ends up that she ended up having to contact 15 different nursing homes trying to find care for her father. She eventually did. Um, he did get to get taken care of um, and died about a year after he uh, was in the nursing home that finally accepted him. So this discrimination happens at SAGE. We've certainly heard um, discrimination against people who are trans that are in long-term care facilities. Um, so these are um, Bill of Rights that can uh, protect people um, and make sure that the staff is trained. Um, so here are some of the states that have already passed. Um, so you'll see California, um, New Jersey, um, Oregon, um, Montgomery County, California, and you see New York there um, because we just passed last week and the governor signed around World AIDS Day. Right now we're working in Minnesota, which is where I am currently living. So we have a group of HIV and LGBTQ plus activists from the community that are working to figure out the best way um, to get something like this introduced in Minnesota to protect people and get that training to those providers. Um, if you want more information about that, we actually have an LGBTQ plus and HIV long-term care bill of rights toolkit on our website. Um, that is a great way to learn more about this and get started in your own state. And of course, we're always here to answer your questions, help provide technical assistance, connect you with the other states that have done this. Um, so that you don't have to start from the beginning. Um, so if you're interested, um, you know, please reach out to us. Um, like I said, we have these tools to help you here. And this is just a bigger um, screenshot of that toolkit that we've developed for folks. So I wanna talk about uh, prevention for a minute um, and how that impacts um, people who are aging um, in our communities. You know, the CDC currently has for their HIV testing recommend recommendations, and I'm just going to read it to you. In all healthcare settings, screening for HIV infection should be performed routinely for all patients aged 13 to 64. We really believe that this upper age limit must be removed. Um, and that we want it changed to in all healthcare settings, screening for HIV should be performed routinely for all patients age 13 and older. And when we say perform routinely, it really means that they need to be offered this HIV test and have the opportunity to get tested. And the reason why this is needed is that many older people, and quite frankly, their providers, don't think that they are vulnerable to HIV. Yet most recent data shows that approximately 17% of new HIV diagnoses in the United States occur among people age 50 and older. 55 and older is 10%. And then looking at the most recent data for people 65 and older, if you look across the years 2017 to 2021, um, we have about 3,500 people that were diagnosed with HIV. But those are what was reported to the CDC. What I'm concerned about is that there may be people who are living with HIV and they don't know it. Um, because in our society, people look at older people as, oh, they're not having sex, they're not using drugs, we don't need to talk about sexual health, um, we don't need to offer them HIV tests or STI screening. Um, and we know that the older a person is when they're diagnosed with HIV, the more likely they are to have advanced disease because nobody offered them early testing. 
So people over 64 are being diagnosed late with advanced disease, and some people have even died, and that's not okay. So, you know, how is removing the upper age limit related to other prevention and care services? Well, the CDC talks about the status neutral HIV prevention and care framework. They have it on their website. The thing about the status neutral approach to HIV prevention and care is that it defines the entry point to care as the time of an HIV test. So if your guidelines say, oh, offered to people 13 and 64, that really sends a message, oh, you don't really need to worry about people 65 and older. Recognizing that these are guidelines, they're not laws, they're not mandates, but they are really powerful. They send a message to medical providers, not only in the United States, but around the world. And so if HIV testing is the entry point to prevention and care, we have to offer folks an HIV test so that they can, you know, see if they are available to start PEP or PrEP. And if their test comes back that they're living with HIV, this is the way that we're able to, to connect them and link them to care. So some of the things that we've been doing at um, SAGE is really raising um, awareness about this. Admiral Levine, who's the deputy um, health commissioner, um, happened to be in New York City. We had a meeting with her. Um, and this is Darcy, who's our executive director at SAGE um, for our SAGE care program. And we had a long conversation with Admiral Levine and invited um, people who are older than 65 to tell their story about how they were diagnosed late and that they had advanced disease. And we had one person share the story of her friend who found out that she had HIV three weeks before she died because nobody had ever offered her an HIV test. So these are real world consequences and we've got to change um, this policy and remove that upper age limit. And I should note that every time I talk about Admiral Levine, people think I'm saying Avril Levine. I am not, <laughs> she is not the same, she is not the Canadian pop singer. Um, so Admiral Levine is a high ranking uh, federal employee um, that we talk with. So there's opportunity to take action here. There's a public comment period that's happening right now through the US Preventative Services Task Force, November 30th through January 3rd. Um, they are looking to get public comment on their draft research plan questions um, to start this process of looking at their recommendations around HIV testing. Um, so this is the beginning of their process. And this is where we could propose through public comment that one of the research questions is to look at um, removing upper age limits in HIV testing guidelines and the impact that um, uh, not offering older people HIV testing could have on their health and their um, ability to have well being. Um, for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's happening now until January 3rd. And then the CDC's HIV testing guideline uh, public comment is coming um, next year. Uh, so it was just at a meeting last, about two weeks ago at the CDC and was informed that that public comment period um, would be happening either the first or second quarter of 2024. Um, and so what I would encourage folks to do is you don't have you don't have to wait to write your public comment for the CDC to remove the upper age limit. You can start crafting it now. So I'll just close by saying, um, reminding everyone of this quote by Alice Walker, that activism is my rent for living on the planet and that we all have a role to play in changing policies in our country. And quite frankly, our policies in the United States affect people across the globe. Um, and so I know that our community has a very long history of activism and it's one of the things that I most love about our community um, and that we can all make a difference by participating in these processes. Um, so I will close here by saying thank you so much for inviting me today. Of course, there's lots more that we could talk about, 
but I'm very interested in people getting in contact with me, particularly around getting your input about the Older Americans Act and making sure that we're um, getting that information to elected officials so that they know what people living with HIV want in terms of the Older Americans Act um, reauthorization. Here's my email. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always available to talk with folks from the community that I love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. I was going to say uh, to please put your uh, email in the chat because there's a lot of questions that came in. Your your presentation and different parts of it hit several nerves, clearly. Um, so I'm going to just go straight to the questions. I, I apologize in advance. We're not going to be able to answer them all. Oh, since you closed your slide, can you please put your email in the yeah, chat? For those? I'm, yeah, let me oh, find the chat. Okay, here it is. All right, I so, can do it right now. So yes, I'm gonna apologize in advance that I'm not gonna to get to everyone's question, but uh, I'll start with Achim, who asks, uh, are there any housing for seniors aging with HIV? And if so, how do we set up to get more housing for those who are aging and living healthy with HIV? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is housing for people living with HIV. Um, there is federal funding through the Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS. Um, that's just the original name of the legislation. We lovingly refer to it as HOPWA. Um, and I should say that um, certain people in our federal uh, uh, name names. officials tried to go after that money um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, of course, our community rallied around and were able to save it. Um, but if you Google you know, housing opportunities for people with HIV or HOPWA, H-O-P-W-A, you'll be able to see more about that program and what um, is available in your community. Thank you. I actually wrote down a couple of questions as well, and these from, were from Lamont. It says, the SAGE have chapters in different cities, and is that a possibility? And also, what other agencies do you partner with? Trying to think who we could partner with uh, that we may not already have. I'm sorry, Tori, can you say the first part of the question again? Does SAGE have chapters in different cities? Oh. And is that a possibility? Yeah, so we do. We um we have what's called like this affiliate model. And um we do have um kind of sages in um, <laughs> if you will, sages in um in um, different states and, you know, I can definitely, I don't know, I, I, we have a link and Wahida, maybe I can share it with you and um, can can distribute it, um, but we do and um, we work very closely with them um, and we have monthly calls um, to coordinate all of our work together. And then Tori, my brain is not working today. <laughs> Can you tell me the second <laughs> question? I get it. Uh, what other <laughs> agencies do you partner with? Oh, sure. Um, so we work with the ACL, which I mentioned, um, Health and Human Services, um, in terms of local, you know, other HIV organizations. I mean, today we're partnering with the Reunion Project. Um, we also um, work with AIDS United, in particular, the lovely Ronald Johnson. Um, and um, we also partner with ANAC, which is the Nurses in AIDS um, Care uh, Nursing Group. Um, you know, we partner with the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership. Um, you know, we partner a lot with equality state chapters across um, the country. Um, you know, just I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so like Aliveness Project and, you know, different local organizations here. Um, so we're constantly working in collaboration with folks across the country. And um, if we if you work for an organization that we've never partnered with, please reach out to me. Um, you know, please do not hesitate to email me. You know, this is this is what I do. And, you know, we have to work together. You know, we have to do it as a community. And you just mentioned Wahida. Uh, she asks, uh, can you expound on what it's meant by the ADA providing caregiver support? Can I expound on the, I didn't catch the first part. What is meant by the ADA providing care, caregiver support? 
the ADA? Yeah. The, you the mean American the American with Disabilities Act. You there was a slide and it was yellow, and it had a lot of things that the ADA helped with, and one of those things was caregiver support. Um. Are you sure it wasn't under the OAA, the Older Americans Act? That's what. I, that's where it was at. <laughs> the, I took a picture of it on my phone, okay. off the screen, and you're right. It was on the OA, OAA. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the Older Americans Act. Yeah. Right. Thank that's you. The Americans Disability Act. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. So the Older Americans Act. So under the Older Americans Act, they provide funding you know, from the federal government to the state's office of aging to support caregivers. Um, you know, one of the things kind of in the aging world is that there is a big push to help people age at home. I mean, I personally don't know one person who wants to live their aging life in a nursing home. So it's right. really a goal to keep people at home. And so a lot of times, you know, people get to stay at home because of their friends or family helping to provide care for them. Um, and so they provide support to caregivers, you know, in a variety of ways, emotional support. Um, you know, there's also opportunities depending on what state or location you live at that you can actually, you know, a lot of times caregivers are like, I have to quit my job to come and take care of my family member. Um, and so they will actually set up where they'll pay the family member to be the caregiver, just like you would hire somebody outside of your family or friends. So right. it's an opportunity for the uh, family member to get income for what they would have been doing anyway. And then they have to leave their job. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I can um I can I can take it from there. I was, I was interested for personal reasons. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll talk later. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you so much, Terry. Again, I apologize to all of the questions we weren't able to get to. We want to of course respect our presenter's time as well as everyone on the call for joining us. Um uh please, if you have any more questions for Terry. Uh, you can email her. Uh, yeah, at, email me. Yes, I'll put it back at the bottom of the chat so you can see it again. It's twilder at sageusa.org. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Terry. <sighs> How you feeling, Tor? I feel good. I was actually laughing to myself. I don't know if you all heard this. That was great, Terry. Thank you. <laughs> Because T. Wilder is also my only fan's name. Uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a joke. It was a joke. It's the end of the day. And that's all I have left. Um, uh, I would uh, like to address one question real yes. quick from Aaron Cunningham, though, because I know we have to go to the men's meet and then we have to go home. And it's, sure how could we make <laughs> mandatory HIV and STD testing in schools, preferably middle schools through colleges? And there were some great questions. We took a lot of notes. You may get some of the responses in uh, email afterwards. Um, but Eric, for most jurisdic jurisdictions around the country, that's going to come from your local school boards. That's not something that, that those aren't decisions that are going to be made top down mandated from the federal government. That's why it's important for more people who are living with HIV and AIDS to be a part of school boards, yes. to be a part of local city councils, to be ombudsman, I saw that word in the um, chat, to be yes. a part of the decision-making processes in your own local communities. Look at uh, Vinton uh, Jones in Texas, who's now a yeah. senator. It's yes. important that we, we take part in our local politics as well. Dr. Agwu says vote local. Yes, vote local, vote often. Uh, so uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Wahida for organizing all this, keeping us all in line. I want to thank Heather for keep uh, for all the back end work and support that she continues to provide us. Uh, she's rushing out to go get her kids in about a minute. And I want to thank all of our viewers and especially my co-partner, co-moderator, co-spartan, Tori Cooper. Behold the green and gold. The green and gold. <laughs> you can't see it. It's behind me. 
Anyway, everyone, happy holidays. The recording for this should be out within a few days or a week or so. Um, but please be safe. Take care of yourself. Uh, take care of the people you love. Don't forget to fill out our evaluation. Uh, so we'll, we'll bring a ton more uh, new events, both virtual and in person in 2024. Um, if you want more information about upcoming events, go to www reunionproject.net um, and contact any one of us as well. Um, thank you so much. Again, happy holidays. Please be safe. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And behold, green and gold. <laughs> green and gold. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day. All roads lead to the reunion project, even at Green. Everybody and they have um nice ho good holidays too. Do the same, Olga. Well, Hita and Larry, can I speak now? <laughs> yeah, Katrina, yes. how you doing? I just want to speak to you guys. I haven't yeah, seen Katrina you here from Bur Bur Birmingham. I see you here from Birmingham. Yeah, I just want to be from Birmingham, from Nola, all of our we have reunion.